Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Open Science Symposium hosted by Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. Thank you for joining us. My name is Melanie Ganey. I'm the director of the Open Science and Data Collaborations Program and a liaison librarian here at CMU Libraries. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about our event today and how we expect that to go. Um, today is our fourth Open Science Symposium, the second that we've held virtually. The day will be a series of short invited talks with panel discussions that address the opportunities and challenges of practicing open research. Um, and I'll just describe these sessions a little bit right now. Um, basically, the way this will work is that we'll have three short talks um, on a given um, theme or topic. And at the end of each talk, there will often be time for a quick one or two questions from the audience. Then at the end of the three talks, we'll bring back our three speakers to do a round of Q&A together. Um, so if you have any questions that are maybe a bit broader um, and maybe a couple of our speakers might be able to answer them, you might wanna save those for the panel Q&A sessions. Uh, we have a really diverse set of speakers here today representing many different disciplines and research methodologies. I'll say that many of their topics are very interdisciplinary as well. Um, and our speakers come from academia, industry, government, publishers, and nonprofits. So really represent a lot of different perspectives on open science. Um, our attendees are also coming from a lot of different places today. We have many researchers from different disciplines attending um, from institutions all across the country and abroad. Uh, we also have many library professionals in the audience. Um, and so we're really excited to have a lot of discussions today um, from this really diverse set of people here. And we really encourage questions. So don't be shy. If you have any questions that occur to you, just please feel free to put them in the Q&A as you think of them. And our moderators will ask our speakers the questions um, when there's a chance to do so. The first Open Science Symposium was in 2018, and this was actually the very first initiative that we had as part of the Open Science and Data Collaborations program. Since 2018, our program has grown to include a pretty wide set of services that support transparent, reproducible, reusable, and publicly available research across disciplines here at Carnegie Mellon and beyond. Um, we do this by providing tools, training opportunities, community building events, such as this one, as well as collaboration opportunities. And you can learn more about our program at this link here. And we also have an open science newsletter that you can get to on that page that um, will let you know what we're up to at any given time. So we are five years out from our very first Open Science Symposium, and it's actually really interesting to look back at that initial program and see um, what has happened with open science in the meantime and what topics we've discussed over the years. I'm just going to give a brief summary of the sessions today and how um, it fits into the context of our other symposia. Um, session one will be um, talks about a few fairly new initiatives here at Carnegie Mellon that center open science in research and learning. Um, session two will be about the intersection of open science and communities. And here we're thinking about communities, both in terms of how we generate open data sets for community use, as well as how do we bring communities together to um, generate open source products for communities. Um, session three will be about the impact of policies. And this is a topic that has often come up in the Q&A discussions at our past symposiums. Um, it's been noted many times that there are not enough incentives right now um, for data sharing and for people to take the time and effort it takes to make their data sets reusable for others. And that institutions have a role to play in this. And so we've never really directly addressed this in the symposia in the past. Um, but today we have speakers representing government and institution perspectives on this, um, and who will be talking about the role that these policies can play in driving changes in behavior in open science and incentivizing them. Um, I'll also note that there's been a lot more conversations on this topic in the last couple of years because of Helios, and so this really felt like the right time for us to have this session here. 
in session four, we'll be talking about open access publishing. And this is a topic that we have talked a lot about in our past symposium, but it's also interesting to see how much this has evolved in the last five years. It's been changing very rapidly. And so, for example, in our very first symposium in 2018, we had a session, uh, sorry, we had a talk that was about the value of archive, the preprint server that a physics professor um, from Carnegie Mellon gave. And it was about the value of preprints to the physics community. And we had that talk because at that time, um, BioArchive was online, but it wasn't widely adopted yet by biomedical researchers. There was still some hesitancy around it. Some of the journals um, kind of discouraged its use. And in the five years since that first symposium, the behaviors around preprints in the biomedical sciences have dramatically changed. We now have MedArchive as well. And there's been a couple of key things that have really driven these changes in behavior, one being the COVID-19 pandemic, where we saw this really dramatic need for um, rapid publishing in the biomedical space, as well as changes in policies from the NIH, where they began allowing researchers to cite preprints in their grant applications and their progress reports. And so this policy um, that incentivized this behavior has really um, dramatically shifted the norms as well. And so open access has really been evolving quickly and we're excited today to have some speakers talking about some very new things happening in OA and um, some initiatives that are really pushing the envelope of what's possible there. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about how we, um, how you can navigate this virtual conference. The whole day will be on Zoom, um, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern daylight time. It's short talks and panel discussions, and you can ask questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom. You can also upvote questions by pressing on the little thumbs up icon on the question. And as I said, just feel free to put the questions in there as you think of them. Um, we're really hoping to have a lot of back and forth between our attendees and panelists today. Uh, we also have a community notes document. This is an interactive Google Doc that you can use to put links, uh, discussion points, comments in, and you'll be able to access that after the event. You can also find all of the logistics info for the event at the top of that document as well. Um, we also have a code of conduct for our event today. We hope that everyone will be respectful to everyone involved with this event on all of the platforms. Um, if you go to this link, it will show you how to report a violation um, of the code of conduct. And if anyone is being disrespectful, we will um, go ahead and remove them from the conference. And finally, before we get started, I'd really like to thank the organizing committee for this symposium. These are all of um, my colleagues I work very closely with on open science at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries, and they all put a lot of work into this. And so I'm very thankful to them. Some of them are going to be moderating today, so you will see them on camera, and some of them are helping this run smoothly behind the scenes. So a huge thank you to them. We also thank our Dean of University Libraries, Keith Webster, for his support of open science in this event. Okay, so with that, uh, we're going to get started with the exciting part of the conference, the actual talks. And so I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Chaz Griego, who will be moderating the first session. All right. Thank you, Melanie. Hi, everyone. My name is Chaz Griego, and I'm a science and engineering librarian here at CMU Libraries, and so I'll be moderating this first session. Um, you've already heard this a few times before, but just real quick, one more just reminder of how the session will run. So each speaker will give a short talk, and then we'll have time for one or two questions. But then after all three talks, we'll invite all of our speakers back on screen for a panel Q&A. And so if you have any questions that might be good for all of the speakers, go ahead and hold those for the panel Q&A at the end of the session. Um, and for all questions, go ahead and please put them at the Q&A and upvote any that you'd also like to hear be addressed. So our first session is focused on new initiatives from here at Carnegie Mellon University that promote transparent reproducibility and public access to information. And our first speaker is Subha Das an Associate Professor of Chemistry at Carnegie Mellon University and the Director of the ChemZone Outreach Project. Um, Das, you can go ahead and share your slides when you're ready.
All right, does that show? Yes. Okay. Now, hopefully there's not too much of a lag and hopefully I'm unmuted as well. Okay. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the I guess, remote control science via the Cloud Lab we've been uh, using. Um, I've used it a little bit for research. Uh, the idea is to use it a lot more for research, uh, but initially it's been uh, for uh, teaching um, a, a, a few classes. Uh, just by way of acknowledgements, uh, you know, I've, I've been teaching a class to use the Cloud Lab since fall 2020. Um, which worked out great in terms of the timing. I uh, hadn't intended to teach it remote, uh, but that's how it worked out. But then since then I've uh, developed the class based on the initial training uh, from the Emerald Cloud Lab. Uh, and you know we have access to that thanks to Brian Fresa and uh, DJ Kleinbaum, who are the founders and uh, CMU alum. Um, and then Malav and, and Ben helped uh, train me and then helped get the classes going. Um, I also want to thank uh, Zach and Laura uh, from the Everly Center for Teaching uh, who've helped, uh, and I'll, I'll mention that later, uh, getting some of the training modules in an online format so we could you know, get it out to a lot more uh, people than in sort of traditional uh, formats. So in, in that way, sort of opening this up to, to even more people. Uh, so uh, if you're not familiar with this, uh, the Cloud Lab it was started by Emerald Cloud Lab around 2000, uh, 2017. Um, and then it you know mainly used by uh, pharmaceutical companies or you know co uh, commercial interests. Uh, but then uh, with a partnership with the Emerald Cloud Lab, CMU is opening uh, the first academic Cloud Lab, if you will. Um, and um, I, I know, you know, based on conversations, they were excited about um, having CMU uh, have a cloud lab uh, because it's an academic environment, which is much more sort of open. Um, mainly, there's so much data in the cloud lab, not just the data from the experiments themselves, but also data about the experiments, how the experiments were conducted, because all of that metadata is collected uh, through this uh, shared you know, and the automated uh, in instruments. Um, so, so that is typically, you know, uh, you know, from their commercial uh, clients, uh, all that data is essentially, in, you know, not not uh, usable by others, right? So, so in in this case, uh, you know, as ac academic uh, academics, we're also excited to sort of you know, have this uh, data available to a lot of others. So the Cloud Lab itself is an automated platform um, and, and that can be remotely automated. Um, and it allows you to also collect all of this information and in a way use uh, new uh, technologies, AI, ML, to also push how the science is done, right? Um, and also get people in a lot of different disciplinary uh, disciplines together, um, mainly because you're using the shared uh, work workspace. And so the cloud lab itself is a, essentially a remote control lab. Um, there's a central uh, code-based platform which runs uh, the, uh, typically on, uh, on and this one is uh, based on Wolfram uh, Mathematica and uh, symbolic language. Um, and that forms a framework to connect all the instrumentations and uh, that's the software platform that runs all of this. Um, and everything is essentially traceable. So everything you do, um, you know, you, you, you write the code for it, everything has an ID, whether it's the room, uh, whether it's the notebook page, whether it's some object, whether it's a data object uh, or, you know, a tubing, all of that, uh, whether, yeah, if it's an instrument, uh, everything has an ID and everything is traceable. Um, and the Cloud Lab itself has, you know, about 200 different instrument types, uh, everything from chemistry, uh, biophysical experiments, biochemical experiments. Uh, you can also do other uh, sort of computational experiments. Uh, the CMU Cloud Lab itself will have a few more um, um, instruments compared to ECL. We'll have more cell culture and more bi biological type experiments uh, fe uh, feasible, uh, sequencing and all of that. Uh, I think there's a full list of uh, instruments. If you go to emeraldcloudlab.com, I'm not sure, uh, sure if the CMU Cloud Lab 
uh, instrument list is public yet, uh, but you should be able to see that. So, oops. Um, so what's the advantage of the Cloud Lab is one is you can, the idea is to do reproducible science and I have actually now data to, to sort of uh, show that and see that, right? Um, um, it should allow um, sort of active learning based um, um, methods to put together uh, these experiments. Um, the other thing I'm excited about and we've already started doing is how it allows uh, collaboration. Uh, one is, you know, the the data is homogeneous because if, if everything is on this platform, uh, others are with, when you're working with collaborators and they are also using the cloud lab to perform experiments, you get the data and everything in the same format. And that's a, a, an issue that's uh, sort of non, uh, you know, that's non-trivial uh, because you, you want people to share data, but you want to share that in a format that's, uh, you know, similar uh, regardless of uh, who's giving it to you. Um, um, yeah, so yeah, I've already covered the breadth of instrumentations and so on. Um, I'm gonna skip this. Uh, well, I I've mentioned already reproducible science, but that's something we sort of wanted to do is, you know, we sort of want to be able to describe our methods really well. Everything is in a notebook in the cloud lab. Um, and so, uh, in the cloud lab, once you share the notebook, uh, another researcher will be able to get that. And I'll show you an example of what the notebook page looks like. Um, main thing um, that I'm really excited about, and I wanted to also train students in this, is we want to also improve access for researchers and students at other institutions uh, for these remotely operated instrumentation. And this past summer, in fact, I had students from Spelman and um, Morehouse College in Atlanta. Uh, they had visited for a conference earlier in uh, at the end of April. Um, and then we, uh, since I taught a course in summer, we were able to get some of their students here. And the idea is that uh, having all this instrumentation available to others also frees up uh, those institutions from having dedicated instruments and labs. Uh, because if you think about it, there's a lot of training and undergraduate labs um, which are there but are not used uh, again when the lab is not you know, in class or the, the amount of time an instrument is used. Uh, if you can increase that, that actually is uh, more efficient and actually the instrument lasts much longer if it's on. Um, so we hope to sort of uh, facilitate facilitate uh, these these partnerships um, and access, as well as ha have other uh, academic uh, partnerships with industry and so on. Um, yeah. So so this timeline. This is an older slide. So this um, again construction and their delays. So the CMU internal rollout is not yet completely uh, ongoing and the cloud lab will open in January, 2024 uh, as um, the information as of two weeks ago. Um, so, uh, and, and the reason one of this, uh, this has also uh, uh, taken slightly longer is because the Emerald Cloud Lab, which used to be in South San Francisco, uh, they shut down and moved to Austin again because they're expanding uh, in 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 a, yeah, quite a bit. So the thing the the old um, uh, cloud lab was uh, fourteen thousand square feet, and they're moving to a hundred and two thousand square uh, feet uh, foot facility in Austin. Um, yeah, I've already mentioned DJ and Brian, um, and that you know we're doing this uh, rem remotely. So the the picture behind me is actually the the picture of the cloud lab, which is set up in um, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, this is in August uh, before I, I I left Pittsburgh. Um, so so yeah, so so it's this is now they're just you know putting everything together and getting it online. So the the if you want to take a virtual tour. Um, you can go to emeraldcloudlab.com and you can just walk through and see what the lab looks like. So I, I, I won't do that here. Um, but it, it's it's remote controlled and automated, but there are, if you can see the picture, there are people who are um, running the, you know, helping do things. There are technicians who move things around, but they do it only according to a specific script. So in that sense, it's still automated and still, you know, based on the, uh, commands and the program and script that you set up. Um, so 
in labs, uh, you know, uh, everywhere in the world, um, you know, there's a lot of automation already, right? So in my own lab, we do a lot of DNA and, and RNA synthesis and work. And so we have automated synthesizers for DNA, right? Um, and, and that's also computer controlled. Uh, so the, the difference between that and the cloud lab is now this is remote. Uh, I can run the DNA synthesizer or any other instrument, um, but also um, the cloud lab collects a lot of data about how the, um, the, the work is done, right? So when I do a DNA synthesis, sometimes it might fail. Uh, here in the cloud lab format, there's all kinds of other in sensors and instruments about humidity, environmental conditions. So that would help in troubleshooting. Um, so how does the, the, the cloud lab work? You set up your experiments from your, from your computer. I can set up uh, experiments from here. Uh, the experiments are run. Um, the data is collected and stored in the cloud. Uh, and then you can, again, uh, analyze and, and look through your data. Um, I'm gonna skip uh, some of these, uh, you know, how exactly these are run. Um, and focus, you know, my, um, goals in, in looking at this really was to look at reproducibility, accessibility, and also efficiency, right? Because if I can do experiments with just the, the right amounts and not have to buy, you know, huge amounts of reagents, which I don't use all of, uh, it, it makes it much more efficient. So in terms of using it for teaching, I had access to larger uh, instruments. The, the only other thing was learning how to use the interface. So that's based, uh, uh, so, so, to teach students, uh, frankly, also myself, how to use this interface. Um, I went into uh, doing simple nucleic acids, DNA-based manipulations. Uh, you know, how do you make a stock solution? How do you measure? How do you dispense? And I figured if students learn to do that, then they can go on to do any other kind of experiments. So these were the courses over fall, uh, starting from fall 2020 that I, I set up. Um, and again, I don't wanna go into too much detail about the specifics of this, and I, I'm happy to go into in, in the Q and A. But the idea was to just you know do simple things, run simple DNA based experiments that you know uh, students should be anyone even without a uh, you know strong background in chemistry should be able to understand, and then run the experiments and then analyze the data. Um, the the since I taught that in fall. 2020 and 2021, um, with the help of the Everly Center, uh, Zach and Laura Potmeyer, um, we were able to set up, uh, convert some of the assignments and course content to an open learning uh, initiative, the OLI uh, modules. So this, um, um, the reason for doing this, I figured was, if I wanted to scale how uh, this class or how the initial training would be, we wanted to have that where it's, you know, of essentially instructorless. Uh, and that was the motivation behind converting a lot of the assignments to this open learning format, uh, where students then access the, the cloud lab, they do the assignments, they do the setup, they do some preliminary type of uh, uh, learning about how the cloud lab works and how to set up experiments. And then we, the second part then is an instructor led course where they do specific experiments uh, for that. So this is how the command center looks like. Um, you log in, uh, there's all kinds of documentation you can look up and, and use. Um, uh, this is what the notebook looks like. Uh, one of the things that the, was somewhat unusual, um, uh, and, and this goes to um, you know, the open science, is that notebooks are all shared, right? So, and you can set up teams in the notebooks so that, you know, but everybody has data. So initially, I wasn't kind of used to that. So um, that was a, a, a bit of a learning for me because I had to set up separate notebooks for each student, uh, at least for when they were doing assignments, right? And then later on, uh, we did group projects and this was really convenient because uh, on the left side, these are all the different notebooks, but each, I've just hidden the, the student names. Um, but this is what a notebook looks like. This is how you set up an experiment. You can see the script. Uh, you can inspect the data and see that. And everybody who has access to that notebook, uh, you know, has access to that. Uh, so later um, I've gone into where we were doing um, shared experiments. Um, so I think 
uh, yeah, I don't want I don't want to go into too much detail on how we do the experiments. Um, but I'll just quickly show you how we the students access the again from the documentation. They can look up what instruments they use, and this is just to show you how reproducible the data is. So these are data of curves. Each curve is from a different student, um, and it's extremely sort of reproducible. Um, and this is another set of data. So again, all the different students have reproducible data, uh, and I can put them all together. Um, these are also not always perfect. So it's not, these are not simulations, right? So this is real data. You can see when the, there's a glitch. Uh, so for example, the bottom uh, right, you can see there's uh, some data that are glitchy. So you can you know, exclude that from the analysis. Uh, I'll finish, and I'll stop here with by showing you, oops, uh, this, uh, I was really happy in 2020. I said, hey, we have some stock left over from 2020. Can we use that in 2022 uh, fall? And in 10 minutes, a student in 2022 was able to take uh, the, uh, the sample that was there from 2020 uh, and run it in 10 minutes, meaning set, set up the experiment in 10 minutes and we got, you know, uh, you know, essentially the same data. So um, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, collaborations and other things, um, you know, this would be, this would be really great to have this kind of platform. Um, you know, it's one, you know, this should be reproducible and you, you know, expect that it would be reproducible. And, you know, that's why we use DNA and, you know, re redo experiments and it should be robust, but to actually see it, um, you know, the, when the when the experiment is run and you see the data and it's the same, uh, you know, with with uh, stuff that's been just sitting in the fridge for two years, uh, that that's uh, that's you know pretty fantastic. So, uh, with that, I'll stop. Um, yeah, and then you know, there's other things you can see in the in the cloud lab. You can see how long the protocol took to run. Um, that's down here. These are things that you typically don't uh, get to do. So I'll stop with that and I'll, you know, I can take questions in the Q&A part. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Das. Um, we only have one time for one quick question that's here in the Q&A. Um, so Siobhan McCarthy is asking, what software is being used for the notebooks? Sorry, a bigger part was the question? Yeah, the question is, what software is being used for the notebooks? Oh, um, so we're using the Emerald Cloud Lab software, but that basically runs uh, sort of mathematic. It's Mathematica based. So the, the programming we do to set up the things is uh, Mathematica. And the okay. Emerald Cloud Lab has its own software that we log in to, to access the notebooks to our, and, and to access the Cloud Lab. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to go ahead and shift to our next speakers. So if anyone else has further questions for Das, you can save those for the panel later. Um, so our next speaker is Saeed Chaudhary, and he's the Associate Dean for Digital Infrastructure and Director of the Open Source Programs Office here at the Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. Um, feel free to share your slides, Saeed. Okay, so hopefully you can hear me uh, and hopefully you can see my slides. Is that the case? Yes. Great. All right, well, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, as Chaz mentioned, I'm the director of the Open Source Programs Office uh, along with Tom Hughes and the Associate Dean for Digital Infrastructure here at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I'm going to talk about a rolling wall of openness and I'll explain what that means, obviously. Uh, but I do need to credit that to Josh Greenberg, who's a program officer at the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And he came up with that term, or he mentioned it to me, I should say, when I was talking about what it means to support open science as science becomes more automated uh, and in some sense more complex and just the way we heard from uh, Professor Das. So in terms of policy, Melanie, Melanie had mentioned uh, earlier that the policy implications um, and there are two sort of large uh, cases of that that are worth mentioning. One is an announcement from the federal government, uh, the White House in particular, that 2023 is the year of open science. Uh, this builds on something that uh, NASA had started, uh, but then several federal agencies have joined up to support this initiative. And I, I did speak with a, a federal 
funding officer fairly recently and said, well, it, you know, it's October, I guess it's November now. Um, you know, what does that mean? Is the year over <laughs> or so on? And he obviously said, no, 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 it's not just one year. This is the launch of a multi-year, uh, you know, sort of long-term type of program. Uh, the, the other is uh, a memo that came out last year from the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, which built on a previous memo uh, about public access. And it basically asserts that the outputs from any federally funded research need to be publicly made uh, available. And there are all sorts of caveats and, and conditions and so on. But uh, fundamentally, it now applies to all federal funding agencies. It removes embargoes on publications and it mentions data very specifically. So uh, I've often thought about these types of uh, policies and memoranda with this diagram in mind, which shows three research objects going from left to right, uh, articles on the left, data in the middle, and software on the right. Uh, and in some sense, the, the policies that are coming out of the federal government are moving left to right in this diagram. They started with papers, uh, now thinking more about data. Uh, and starting to imagine uh, software, but I will say that software has not been mentioned explicitly, at least in part, because there's a concern about capacity within universities to address uh, any kind of conditions or provisions that might come out. So the Open Source Programs Office, in some sense, is a response to that. Uh, we, we see ourselves as being a community convener, uh, a clearinghouse of sorts, and helping to better discover, manage, curate, and share uh, open source software. And then the arrows that you see coming on the right side of that diagram are what kinds of impact may be possible if you have well-managed and curated software. Uh, the, the squiggly lines between the data and the software is my attempt to you know, convey that the relationship between data and software is more complex. Uh, typically the relationship between data and a paper is a citation. But if you think about data and software, the, the boundaries are blurred. It's a little hard to sort of distinguish them. And this is partially what I'm getting at in terms of this rolling wall of openness. As we start to think more about data and software, as we start to think more about the new kinds of science that are being conducted and the new kinds of facilities that are being built uh, and infrastructure that's being supported, it's going to be harder to differentiate between data and software. And I think it's going to be harder to be binary about what it means to be open. So while there are some nuances, you can basically say, is an article open or not? Do I have to have a subscription or go through a paywall to get to the article? Is something you can ask. Uh, I think it's a lot more complex, a lot more nuanced with data. And while meant much of software is released as open source, uh, there are different ways you can use it. There are different things you can do with the data uh, and, and so on. We just heard uh, an excellent presentation about Cloud Lab. Uh, it's a very exciting initiative. I don't need to go over everything you just heard. Uh, the one thing I will mention is that there's also interest in looking at Cloud Lab as a model for a national network uh, of these so-called remote control laboratories or self-driving laboratories. Uh, there was a workshop just about a week ago at Carnegie Mellon uh, that brought together uh, several members of, of the research community, uh, people from the National Science Foundation, leadership at Carnegie Mellon to discuss exactly that. So this is not only a trend, I think, for a Carnegie Mellon, but, but largely speaking for the life sciences, material sciences, um, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, and so on, several disciplines. So it, as you heard, it, it, there are many kinds of artifacts, <laughs> outputs that are being produced in Cloud Lab. And my background is in systems engineering. Um, and so when I heard this for the first time, it, it was this sort of, aha, uh -huh, well, of course, you know, it's obvious once you hear it. But in many of these disciplines that use Cloud Lab, the environmental conditions do matter. You know, what the temperature may be, the humidity may be, actually affects, you know, how your experiment is run. So that kind of metadata, uh, you know, as Professor Das described it, is really critical, actually, from a reproducibility perspective. So when you say we're going to make the data open, it's now important to start asking questions, around, well, should the metadata be open? Uh, and those notebooks, you know, are they data? Are they software? Are they something in between? Uh, you know, like Jupyter notebooks. So we now start to have all these different kinds of, you know, software artifacts is probably a better term. Uh, but then you also have machine learning models, algorithms, you know, AI models. You have hardware. There's a lot of equipment in this facility. There's a very uh, robust and healthy open science hardware uh, community that's now asking questions about can the instrumentation be more open? 
Um, you know, what does that mean? Does the instrumentation have to be open in order for it to be reproducibility? Or do we influence, you know, the instrumentation makers? Uh, do we ask them to think about standards? These are complex questions that don't come up when you're thinking just about an article about whether it's open or not. It's also really important to note that as you heard, the Cloud Lab original facility was built for uh, startups, private sector companies in the Bay Area who deliberately did not want to share with each other for obvious reasons. Uh, moving to a university setting uh, is very different. And there's great interest in sharing not only the research outputs, but the teaching methods uh, and so on that you heard. So we're taking what is inherently, you know, not through any fault of Emerald Cloud Lab or any sort of design decision per se, a closed system and opening it up. Uh, and that has some very interesting implications in terms of how that works. So I applaud ECL. Uh, they've open sourced their, their software, their programming language for ECL. That's a great step. But we're working with them to better understand what are the implications of opening this system up. And mind you, it's important to keep in mind things like the commercial potential, right? Uh, one thing that came up in these conversations was, you know, there, there may be far pharmaceutical companies that are interested in the protocols that are being developed. Um, do we open them up immediately? Do we open them up after some point? Uh, I don't have an answer per se, but these are the questions that I think merit some further exploration. I spent a good part of my career working with astronomers who have very open data. It has no commercial value. It has no PC issues. It's sort of ideal in the sense of data sharing. But even they have embargoes to research purposes. When a team of astronomers creates a new data set, they get first right of analysis to it before they release it to the rest of the community. So it's not like the precedent doesn't exist, but I think it's a lot more complicated uh, and complex in this particular uh, environment. Uh, this is a, a screenshot from the National Academy's workshop, uh, sorry, um, report. Uh, that looked at new automated research workflows, the impact, uh, and not surprisingly talks a lot about machine learning uh, and uh, artificial intelligence, which you also heard uh, from Professor Das. And this is a very simplistic way of thinking of it, but in some sense, machine learning is helping people analyze the results, the researchers uh, analyze the results of the research, sort of coming up with interesting ways of exploring where else to, to look at results. Whereas AI might move us in the direction of actually helping design experiments, you know, that you don't necessarily think of uh, in, in the traditional ways of doing science. But this raises all sorts of other questions about openness, right? Uh, when, when you're talking about large language models, for example, and I'm hearing a great deal about everything in AI needs to be open. Well, what does that mean? Um, so imagine the data, for example, uh, Facebook's large language model probably to no one's surprise, uses the data that Facebook has been gathering for years uh, through their platform. But some of that comes from, from kids, people under 18, right? Some of that, while you shouldn't talk about medical information <laughs> on Facebook, people do. Um, so should those be open? Probably not. Uh, it's not a clear cut question again, that data should be open or not. Is it enough if the data are open? Is it enough if the, the code is open source? Is it enough if the weights are open? So this is that sense of a rolling wall of openness that we don't necessarily go in and say everything is open or it isn't. Uh, we have to explore these in much more deep sort of nuanced ways, understanding the interconnection between all the research outputs and artifacts. Uh, and he may even sort of question in some sense, the licenses uh, that are typically applied for open source software uh, that come out of the open source initiative. I know Mike Blackhurst is gonna speak next about the open energy outlook. I've been talking with him about that project and the code. Uh, many of the recommendations that come out of university tech transfer offices for the open source licenses, understandably are about patents and commercialization. But what if you want to build a community? What if, as in the case I believe is true with OEO, there's interest from the government. There may be interest from companies. There may be interest from other universities. Those are different communities. <laughs> How do licenses have impacts on all of, all of those types of interactions? So I, I know there are things that remain to be addressed, even for something like open access of articles. Um, and I'm not trying to sound, uh, you know, somewhat, um, you know, put a challenge out there, but I do think we have to think more, uh, you know, systematically and comprehensively about all the nuances of sort of a continuum uh, of open rather than a binary nature of what is open and what is not. 
Um, so if we have time for a question to right now, I'd be happy to do that, but certainly looking forward to the panel discussion as well. Great, thank you, Saeed. Um, yeah, we, we have time for a couple questions. So if anyone, there are none in the Q&A right now, but if there's, if anyone has a quick burning question they'd like to put in, go ahead. Um, Saeed, I'll go ahead and just uh, ask you one quick question. So one thing I think about is when it comes to opening data, as you said, there is a lot of concerns about privacy and there's aspects that shouldn't be shared, some may not wanna share. So with code, you know, a lot of a lot of people may not understand code or be able to read code. Do you anticipate there's similar concerns about, aside from kind of monetary things, would there be concern about, okay, I shouldn't open this up? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, I, I did think about mentioning this during the talk. Um, there, there, there are concerns, obviously, about unintended consequences um, or, or maybe even malicious uses, right? Um, if you think about a facility like Cloud Lab, where there's all sorts of materials, hazardous materials, you can make all sorts of hazard materials, maybe. Or if you think about AI, um, in terms of uh, there's a company called Collaborations Pharmaceutical that published a paper about how easy it was to generate toxins uh, using their AI models. So transparency is a really important part of reproducibility, right? Um, but if transparency exposes potentially negative uses uh, or negative outcomes, how do we handle that? Uh, I don't think the answer is to say, no, we don't ever talk about it. Um, but I think the way we talk about it has to be done in a very thoughtful and deliberate way. Um, because, and it, it doesn't even have to be malicious. You, 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 you don't want people trying experiments at home based on things they're trying uh, you know, in the cloud lab. We, we have to make sure that the, the capacity the awareness, you know, education and capacity is raised so that people understand the implications of what, what they're doing, with these facilities and these tools. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we're going to go ahead and move forward. So thank you again, Saeed. Um, so our last speaker for this session is Michael Blackhurst, the Executive Director of the Open Energy Outlook Initiative in the Department of Energy and Public Policy here at Carnegie Mellon University. Mike, go ahead and share your slides and you're ready. Sure. <clears throat> Are you able to see the slides and hear me? We can hear you, but we cannot see your slides. Okay, let me. Let me oh, I didn't see that through. Sorry. Uh, this is it here. How are we now? All good. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having. Uh, the Open Energy Outlook group here. Uh, it's really interesting to see the first two talks. I really appreciate the nod from Saeed and uh, the challenge that he set up with respect to, um, you know, making sure that open software has similar value to IP. That's definitely a challenge. It's not highlighted here, but I'd love to talk more about it if the group is interested. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about what OEO is, the model that we house, that's the software that we house that I had mentioned, and why open science is important in this space. Um, some of it's going to be kind of traditional. Here's a here's a method and here's a some example results. Some of it's going to be uh, focusing on the open science aspect, but it's all intended to be layperson uh, level so that uh, you know broad group of people can understand what, what's going on. Um, you probably, this is probably not new to you, but decarbonizing the U.S. economy is going to be an unprecedented challenge. Uh, we're looking at possibly having to spend 4% of GDP per year through 2050 to do that. And it will require the coordination of a lot of different actors with different motivations, some of which are private sector actors, some of which are policymakers, some of which are our everyday folks. Uh, and there are millions of different decisions that need to be nudged or, or incentivized to be able to do this uh, at scale. <clears throat> so why is open science so important for decarbonization? Well, like I said in the previous slide, we have to coordinate a lot of different decisions and they, they really do have to be coordinated to do this well. Um, we have to under democratize the understanding of the opportunities and challenges. Um, we really need to build trust. That's an important uh, part of this. Transparency, replicability, and community are required given the costs and risks. Uh, 
decarbonization touches all disciplines. Um, I'm an engineer, but I really appreciate social science and how important it is. And I'd like to see it, it, it more utilized in our space. Um, and we need to sustain a commitment to the spirit of open science to ensure that we can meet our, our decarbonization goals. <clears throat> So in the briefest terms, the Open Energy Outlook Initiative examines U.S. energy futures to inform energy climate policy efforts by applying the gold standards of policy-focused modeling, maximizing transparency, and building community, uh, building a user community. Sorry, I had to move some windows around to be able to read my own slides. Um, and I highlight this part in red in that it, I think it's the most aligned with the spirit of open science. If you if you follow our work, you'll see a couple of different acronyms that are thrown around, and I get a lot of questions about what they how they're different. We use this method called the Tools for Energy Model Optimization and Analysis, which has an acronym that's pronounced TOMOA. Um, TOMOA is just a general method; it's essentially algebra, and the Open Energy Outlook or OEO refers to both an, a US instance of TOMOA, that is all the data we've collected to build the model, uh, to, to make the algebra run, if you will, and the broader initiative, the broader OEO initiative. I know this is somewhat complex for those of you who aren't in the energy space, but you can simply think of this as a, as a flow diagram from energy sources. These are all the choices we have and how we power our economy on the very left-hand side. And we convert those sources to energy services. Uh, we make electricity, we refine petroleum, and then we buy technologies that provide a service to us like lighting or space cooling. And TOMOA reflects the network of how we move energy from sources to services. <clears throat> um, the heart of it is relatively simple. If, if you tell me what the prices and the operating characteristics are of the technologies we could choose, I will tell, tomorrow will tell you what the least cost set of those technologies are to meet your demands. So all these things with question marks on here, what sources should we use? What conversion technologies should we use? What end use technologies like appliances we should use? Those are things that Tomo will find for you. And you have to tell it what the prices of those things are and how much energy you need. You know, if this is still a little bit opaque, you can think about designing a house using TOMOA, where you tell TOMOA, I need so much energy for lighting and here are all the choices I have. I need so much energy for heating and here are all the choices I have. And here are all the prices for those technologies and fuels. And it will tell you um, what the least cost set of technologies are. <clears throat> so I'll skip this for, for, time, uh, for, for time, but this is a description of it's a meta description of the information that we collect, the publicly available information we collect to outfit TOMOA to make it representative of the US energy system. Gives you some indication of how we divide up the model in time and space. Uh, and probably key to the open science community is that it's written in Python. <clears throat> Other things that TOMOA does, OEO does well, is we can you can add all sorts of user-specified constraints. So you could imagine that we are concerned about emissions as well. We can schedule emission reductions, custom emission reductions by year. We can introduce a carbon price and figure out how the, the least cost set of technologies and sources change in re reaction to those different constraints. Um, we can do policy analysis, like introducing the sub a subsidy for a technology. Um, I'll talk about how the Inflation Reduction Act introduces subsidies and how we've modeled that to estimate emissions in the subsequent slides. And we could do neat analysis with respect to uncertainty and variability, which is really essential in a climate and energy space. There's enormous amounts of uncertainty and variability and, and being able to model that well is, is essential. <clears throat> Here's some example questions that the model can answer. You know, what technology pathways are essential to decarbonization? Um, what are the cost and emission implications of different policy approaches? I'll give you some results in the in the subsequent slides that, that speak to these questions. Um, what decarbon decarbonization policies are robust to uncertainty? How much flexibility do we have in trying to meet our policy objectives? So these are just examples of how, how we can use the model. And here's some recent results. For those of you who aren't used to looking at these acronyms, 
I wouldn't worry about the various colors on the slide, but you could think about the top of them being the total US emissions. Um, some of these may be uh, particular labels may be intuitive for those of you who have worked in the energy space. But, but what we did was estimate how the IRA, the in Inflation Reduction Act might impact emissions. And so we see that during the IRA's active subsidy period, which stops in around 2033, you can see the dashed line on the x-axis there, we, we estimate about a 30% reduction in emissions. And as the IRA subsidies expire, we see emissions rise a little bit again and then level off around 2040. Um, and a lot of the reductions that we get from the IRA come from the electric power sector, which is shown there in green, and the transportation sector, which is shown there in purple. Those are intuitively, those come from more renewables and electrifying transportation to some degree and a little more biomass used for, um, for powering our transportation system. <clears throat> Uh, but as you can see in these charts, if you don't worry about the colors, you just see we still have a bunch of emissions at the end of 2050. So we could use TMOA to say, what else do we need, OEO, I should say, to, to reduce emissions to, to zero. Um, and so we impose a, a carbon constraint in the model and we say what, what technologies and, and sources are least cost in getting to zero. And we see more emissions being squeezed out of the transportation sector, electric power sector. We see things like BEX to hydrogen. So that we see using, that means bioenergy, biomass for making hydrogen. And we see this technology called DAC, which is direct air capture. That's sucking carbon out of the atmosphere. So we see a lot more use of what we call negative carbon technologies if we really want to get to zero carbon, zero emissions by 2050. <clears throat> Um, these charts, uh, I just pulled these charts as an another example of one, we can do some uncertainty modeling and variability modeling. Um, the, the ranges in these charts, if you're not familiar with box plots, you might just ignore me for a minute or two, but, uh, the ranges reflect different portfolios that are really near least costs. So one of the neat things about our model is that we can tell you what the least cost set of things are that will meet your goals. But we also can tell you a whole bunch of different sets that are very close to the least cost. So it avoids this lock-in effect that sometimes happens in these models where policymakers might find certain technologies intractable for a whole host of reasons. Maybe there's a jurisdictional issue, maybe there's an equity issue, political issue. So we're able to say, what are some other pathways to meeting our goals that don't require a singular set of, of technologies? And that's what the ranges show, are shown here. And the, the key takeaway here is if you look at the upper left-hand box, we're going to need a lot more electric power. Uh, you might have heard of electrification as being an important in meeting our emission goals. So we're going to need a lot more electric power for all sorts of things. And that's going to require that we coordinate um, it increases in renewable supplies, as you can see in the other charts, and some battery storage as well to do that. If we don't uh, coordinate those things, then we're going to actually increase emissions as people try to electrify their end uses. <clears throat> and then what we can do is, like I said before, we, we, in the previous slide, we can we are able to identify different pathways to achieving the same goals that are almost essentially the same. And so we are able to group those pathways into different scenarios, which are shown here in the various columns. We have a low hydrogen scenario. And that's the that that has a, a lot of carbon being captured from coal plants. So you could see that in the in the dark gray. Uh, I wish I could, I could use my mouse here, but uh, the the low hydrogen scenario requires a lot of sequestration of emissions from make, uh, continuing to use coal. Whereas uh, if you look at the ele high electricity scenario, you see a lot more renewables and a lot less. Um, coal use and therefore a lot less sequestration of emissions from coal. So the point the point of this is that one of the neat things about our model is we, we can avoid a lock-in effect and we can uh, identify a whole host of similar uh, stra similar strategies that have similar or different strategies that have similar um, effect on emissions. <clears throat> um, we have a whole host of online resources that in, invites uh, potential users. Uh, these are intended to create a community. Um, 
I will admit that the, the learning curve is still a little steep and we're working on that. I'm happy to talk more about that. Uh, we published an annual energy, uh, open energy outlook the last year, and we're working on a, a, a new one. Uh, you can find that at our, at this link here. This is this picture on the left is the cover page. And then I picked out a few charts that are similar to what we've already shown that are in that. Um, and then one thing that I really wanna emphasize it is a real challenge, but I think it's also a real opportunity is that, you know, this model will identify technology as an opportunity, but it, it's it's only a solution if we can coordinate with other actors, which is another reason we wanna be open and transparent and accessible. Um, we, we need a lots of other uh, researchers and stakeholders to engage with us in this community to be able to achieve our goals. And so we see our model as part of a bigger community and want to help grow that community. And that's part of the spirit of why we're, we're, uh, we're open. I think that may be, oh, so here are some things we're doing to make OEO more open. Um, we're reactivating our advisory board which will include about 20 to 40 members. We're looking to form a corporate consortium to inform model development and applications. We are streamlining and updating the model code. It hasn't been updated for some time, so that hopefully will make it a little bit easier for new users to, to, to use the model. We're looking to publish our results in a more user-friendly format so that even if you don't uh, know how to run the model, you can still make use of our results. As I mentioned, we're publishing a second Open Energy Outlook we're imminently starting an open energy blog, which I'm excited about. Um, and then we're always looking for opportunities to collaborate. So if, if you see anybody who wants to participate in, in collaborating with us and along these lines, please reach out to me. Um, as you probably know, a real challenge that we face is few people want to support maintaining uh, an analytical resource. And we always do some innovation alongside um, alongside maintenance, which kind of can help at times, but um, it's really been, it's, it's hard to find people who are enthusiastic about kind of maintaining a resource uh, in the spirit of openness. And so love to talk to you more about how we could overcome that challenge. And finally, I just want to make sure I thank the Sloan Foundation for the, for the opportunity they created for me and for our model. Um, the Scott Institute is a big supporter and houses uh, our 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 website, if you will, um, and it's been a really excellent collaborator and, and here are the team members that, that help make the initiative successful and, and help make me successful. That's all. Great, thank you so much, Mike. Um, again, if anyone has any quick questions directly for uh, Mike, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Um, for now, I'll go ahead and just ask uh, one quick question. So, you know, we're all aware of climate change deniers, but you know, there's there's that kind of middle section of people who don't don't think about these technical issues as much, but they do have really good questions. And one question that I sometimes get in regards to like electric cars is, you know, why should I invest in driving an electric vehicle when electricity is still being produced by fossil fuels, producing emissions, yada, yada. Um, so with uh, the resources that the Open Energy Outlook's creating to MOA, um, do you envision this can be some type of tool that anyone can, you know, refer to someone, pull it to someone and say, here's a way that we can answer your question with, with models and data? Well, I often, when I would teach concepts like this, I would try to, to help students understand the difference between a, a market taker and a market maker. And the influence of scale is really important here. So I would say that if you're an individual person and your, your only uh, change that is happening is your individual car, it's not going to have any impact on, on supply. Uh, and so I wouldn't necessarily make that a center point of my decision is probably what I would would tell the, the individual person. But our model certainly could be used to help understand as you scale up, lots of people choose electric vehicles and we don't decarbonize the grid. What would, what would the emissions look like? Or if we decarbonize the grid and don't commensurately switch to more electric end uses will have a bunch of excess renewables with nothing to do with them, right? So those are the kind of things that our model could do, but I would, the feedback I would give to your, 
your individual uh, friend or colleague is that you know an individual decision is not going to be a market making decision. <clears throat> Does that make any sense? Probably yeah, not I no. answer, I understand, but but the model isn't isn't for individual decision making. It's it's at a different scale. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's really great to hear that with this model, you can assess, you know, these different variables, different outcomes, different technologies. Um, well, thank you again, Mike. Um, so now we're gonna go ahead and just invite all of our speakers back on the screen and they can answer questions together as a panel. Um, and so again, everyone, please feel free to post questions in the Q&A and I'll be uh, moderating. Well, I'll have a question for Saeed if nobody else has questions. So, but I'll I'll, I'll defer to others if uh, if nobody has questions, I'm happy to ask one. Yeah, feel free. Well, I I was I keyed on your anecdote, Saeed, with respect to that that described Facebook having sensitive medical information as a potential challenge to transparency, but I also thought, on one hand. You know that could Facebook and others like Facebook could use that as a as a excuse or a constraint to not being transparent, and that could further incentivize them collecting a bunch of protected information. So, are those part of the the challenges and and decisions? You know, how how do you reflect upon that that challenge there? Yeah, that's a really good question, Mike. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a an understandable concern, uh, particularly with AI, that uh, the, the response from a lot of the big tech players like uh, Facebook or Meta uh, or, or Google or Microsoft is along the lines you just described. That we have these, these data we shouldn't share, and it's really too complicated for us to figure out how to do it, right? You know, you could say, why don't you just strip out anyone under the age of 18? Why don't you strip out, you know, anyone under... Uh, you're talking about medical data, and they say, we have, you know, petabytes of data. How do you expect us to do this? So I think it really, you know, I'll, I'll issue this as a call, you know, or challenge to our community is we have to come up with ways to sort of hold them accountable, right? You may be aware of the, the big announcement that came out of the White House this week about AI. Um, I am not an expert <laughs> in how these things are written and how they should be interpreted. But one of my takeaways was, there's nothing in there that a company has to do. <laughs> There's a lot of recommendations, a lot of suggestions, a lot of please do this. Um, but I, you know, these companies might look at that and say, "There's nothing in there that's actionable for us, right?" So, as a community, we need to come up with mechanisms to do that. So, in the case you just described, for example, one could be even if you can't share the data, you need to produce some sort of data profiles. Right. In, in the software world, we call them, you know, software bill of materials. Right. So I just understand what's in the data, how it's composed, what are the profiles. Um, you know, there's uh, Alex London, professor at CMU, gave a talk at the library's uh, summer retreat where he shared uh, an analysis of classifying, you know, faces uh, using AI models. And it was tuned on basically, you know, white men. Uh, and when that was discovered, Microsoft went back and we added, you know, data to make it a more diverse set. Um, so just that little bit of an insight that your data was composed of the following types of images allows some kind of response, some kind of remediation. So are there data curation profiles that we can produce to say, you need to at least describe your data in this way. Uh, if you can't share, you know, your, your model weights, you at least need to tell us what you were waiting. Um, so this is where I'm getting at. If you if you just show up and say, make everything open, legitimately, even a big tech company might say, we simply can't do that. And if that's the end of the conversation, then we haven't made any progress. So I think we need to think more about this nuanced kind of rolling wave of, of how we can get insights into what's happening, even if we can't see the actual content. Awesome. Thank you. And I have a question for both of you, Chaz, no one else has asked a question. <laughs> well, it looks like we just got one question in the okay. Q&A. Um, okay, so this is from Cheryl. 
How do we balance openness with the current academic model of journal publication credit for promotion and tenure? Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll start. Uh, not, not, not something to answer simply. Uh, so I, I really will just start. Um, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a complex web uh, that that you know you're describing with that question. And I think with articles, you know, maybe this is somewhat controversial, right? We 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 ended up with these sort of unintended, maybe even somewhat perverse ways of which people are assessed in terms of the impact they're having, uh, the impact factor, and, and so on. Um, deconstructing that, re-engineering that is very difficult, uh, but I, I, I'm not trying to dodge that. But what I am going to say is that with data and software, we have new opportunities to, to get it you know, right, to do it better. Um, you may be aware of something that came out from GitHub called the GitHub Innovation Graph, where it aggregates GitHub you know, data in a very large scale at the national level and looks at things like how many you know, commits are made to a repository. And it's a good tool, but I immediately contacted people at GitHub and said, for goodness sake, please don't start counting number of commits to a repository as a metric, right? That, that'll just be a disaster. Um, I, I will go fix documentation, right? <laughs> I will remove spaces from documentation and just make commits. So uh, I think the lessons that we, we have learned from the article side, we need to apply in terms of metrics around data and software. And I will say that the federal you know, funders and you know, the year of open science and so on is giving us an entree and a pathway to think about better metrics for data and software. Um, you know, while we, we certainly need to try and keep working on uh, how, how people assess articles, you mentioned, you know, uh, sorry, uh, Melanie had mentioned Helios, which is the Higher Education Leadership Initiative for Open Scholarship. That has a group looking at reappointment, promotion, and tenure practices, and is trying to introduce open science into updating or modernizing some of the uh, RPT processes. So I think that's a group where we really want to try and engage with them. Yeah, I, I, I have been in various academic positions from tenure track streams to, uh, you know, administrative positions. And, um, you know, on one hand, a, a rubric that might work would is to, um, get all your publications out and then make wh whatever fodder from those publications available openly, uh, make it open th that, uh, requires a lot of time and energy that then distracts from further promotional activities. Um, and so I see people who are really care about the, the visible public impact of their work, making that a priority and, and accepting the opportunity cost that comes from investing in, in proposals and publications. Uh, I think that it's really nice to see some sponsors focus on open science and and standards for uh, accessible research products that are federally funded uh, come out. Those are really helpful. I think that will that will refocus the way that um, reprioritize sponsors' priorities. So if sponsors say we really care about open science, then that will flow towards people who want to provide open products and that will help with their promotion. Um, but I, I also think, and, and I, I'm not definitely not an expert here, but I wonder if, if there's going to be a, a, you know, the study of, of what makes things open and successfully open as a whole other branch of, of science that could really help, um, you know, align traditional academic tenure evaluation with, and you know, keeping things open. Um, it's really hard to figure out how effective a certain decision might be in the open science space. We are gonna start a blog and we have got mixed advice about that. And uh, I'm excited about it, but you know, that's not something that is necessarily gonna help somebody with promotion. So, you know, getting a better understanding of, of what is successful in the context of open using the traditional metrics of science could be a good sea change. And I don't know if the others here have you know, expertise in that, they could comment on that, but I'd be interested in learning more about that as an opportunity to merge those two, to overcome that constraint when it comes to, to tenure. <clears throat> hey, 
any other thoughts about this topic from the panel? Yeah, I mean, I'll just quickly say that I think people recognize the thing about, you know, just publications. So it's not just publications as part of uh, the tenure and promotions. I mean, that is one part of it, but I think people recognize their issues with that. So, yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, thank you all. Um, and it looks like we're getting some good discussion here on this question in the chat. Um, again, anyone else has other questions for the panel, feel free to put them in there. Um, I think we may have a question from Melody. Yes, hi. Um, and for anyone who's interested in that topic, we will have a panel later this afternoon on um, promotion and tenure and incentivization and whatnot. But um, Mike, you noted that there is kind of a steep learning curve for using some of these resources. And I've also heard that in the context of the cloud lab. And it reminded me of a comment and some discussion at a round table we hosted in September around data sharing. And one of the biology professors here at Carnegie Mellon, Joel McManus, um, suggested that we might need to rethink the way that we traditionally do um, graduate education in biology, where it's very focused on reading and discussing papers, but the students don't necessarily access underlying data, um, think about how to reuse that data and whatnot. And so maybe uh, the way we traditionally do that education hasn't really kept up with the advances in open science. And so I'm curious if you think that there are broad implications for how we think about graduate education, undergraduate education to prepare this um, next generation of researchers for participating in open science and the technical skill sets they might need to do that. Well, yeah, I, I have really, I hope my slides were indicative of this, but I have focused on trying to be a better science communicator with age. And I have had some formal training in science communication. And I agree a hundred percent that we, if we could make a little space in ABET and accreditations, um, we could possibly, uh, you know, offer some additional electives that not just complement the opportunity for science communication to help people become better thought leaders as they grow throughout their career. But then, you know, I think there's been an appropriate and healthy focus on technology and society writ large that I think is also aligned with this. Um, what should engineers and scientists know about ethics and equity? How can we bring in the quote unquote normative dimensions of technology and make sure that we're 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 educating long term thought leaders? Uh, so, and I think science communication is is one of those important elements to 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 preparing long term thought leaders, especially in in the technology space. <clears throat> Yeah, I'll just add that in context of the cloud lab as well, um, we, we do have to e e evaluate, uh, I mean, even without the cloud lab, you know, evaluate or reevaluate, you know, how we do things, how we do, you know, education at, at different levels, just to keep up with, you know, technology, but also advances in, in science. But in, for example, in the cloud lab, um, the, the also the question is, um, you know, when you're, how how exactly are you teaching students to do experiments and what's important in an experiment itself, right? Is it the ability to do something well 10 times or is it the ability to design the experiment? So if you're doing cloud lab experiments, does that count? And uh, this goes towards accreditation as well. You know, does that count as a lab course? Uh, right now, the courses I've taught don't are not classified as a lab course. <laughs> It's a computer course, but that's also, in, yeah. So, but these are things that, you know, we'll have to figure out as well. So I just want to add uh, and, and give appropriate credit here. This, this comes from prior work I've done with Chris Borgman um, and Cal Palmer from the information science community. And, and both of them, um, you know, I'm paraphrasing of course, in essence said to me that one of the important things about open science is that it makes the implicit explicit 
right? So a, a big part of, of graduate training or even, you know, advanced undergraduate training or, or any undergraduate training, I should say, is conveying tacit knowledge, right? I mean, that that's ultimately when you go into a lab or you go into a research group or so on, you're trying to sort of learn the tacit knowledge that, that makes that that group work and the, the science from that group work. And I think things like, you know, Tomoa and Cloud Lab and, and other types of, you know, new types of scientific systems are getting better at that explicit, implicit knowledge being explicit, right? And, and, and the more open it is, the more anyone can come along, even if you're not from your lab, uh, and see how something, how research is done, how an experiment is done, what methods, you know, what data and so on. So I, I do think openness as a way of lowering that threshold of bringing in the next generation is, is a really important driver and reason why open science is important. Thank you. Okay, still, still a little bit of quiet in the, the Q&A, but I'll, I'll go ahead and try to pick everyone's brain for the time being. Um, so one thing that I, I've been thinking about lately is kind of just the future and anticipating technology, predicting advances we're going to make. And we have a, a pretty good idea about some of the things with, with AI and um, other things like that. But as, as we're all aware right now, we're in a virtual webinar on Zoom, and this is something that we wouldn't have even thought about as, as early back as 2019. And so um, I'm just curious if anyone has any thoughts about, you know, could there be any kind of disruptive technologies or th things that happen? And do you think that might set us back in our progress of opening things, open science, or any other initiatives that we're rate making? And I'll apologize in advance for a very, a very deep question. I think you should, you should be applauded for asking deep questions and trying to articulate what you're thinking. That's a good thing. Um, well, have you seen Black Mirror? Have you watched the, the show Black Mirror? That might be a good place to start if you haven't seen that. Uh, I, I don't, there's a lot of deep, deep thinking that comes alongside that, but uh, that would be the easiest way for me to sum up some type of response. So Jazz, I'm not sure if this is uh, the direction you were thinking that question might go, but one other thing I've heard in the cloud lab context, but I think it applies even with the open energy outlook is not losing touch with the physical, right? Um, is that even, even if a grad student could come along and just go into Cloud Lab and learn just by looking at data and notebooks and, and models and so on, how to perform experiments, the value of actually handling materials, right? Um, so way back in the Stone Age when I was an undergraduate <laughs> in a lab, um, we, we took these lacrosse balls actually and put them in liquid nitrogen and then you know, they would shatter. And then as you held them, in your hand, the heat of your hands would sort of start to warm them up and you can start to feel them get soft again. Um, is that something you can emulate easily in <laughs> a virtual environment? Um, so the, the importance of what's actually happening uh, physically in terms of what you're modeling and experimenting. And if you think about you know, decarbonization, it's like, it, 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 that's a great model, but if someone experiences poor air quality, uh, that, that's a very different way of thinking about it than looking at a model result. So I, I'm hoping disruptive technologies can actually move us in the direction of making sure we don't lose that that sort of physical experience, which I think also makes it important, uh, is an um, important component of, of open science. Yeah, yeah, just to follow on briefly, I, I think a, a similar thought, which is it's important, I think it's really important to remember the personal narrative that comes alongside with whatever the technology uh, your study is in the context of decarbonization. I grew up in Appalachia, and it's a it's a very challenging um, story for that community, and it has been probably to our shared detriment and even their detriment to um, try to force upon a community. Um, major societal change that has disproportionate costs and benefits. Um, 
So I think part of the opportunity with being transparent, if being transparent also means being inclusive and building a community, I think that's a good thing. I think what I heard in your question to some degree is, you know, is it is the push to being super transparent going to have unintended consequences? And I think, I don't think in this particular case that's true. And, and even more broadly, we have major asymmetries with who has access to information such that being more transparent and inclusive seems to me intuitively that it, it can have, you know, drastic negatives. Um, but that, you know, that would be a really nice additional pivot in how we do research and fund research would be to, to make sure that we're telling those personal narratives alongside the innovation so that we can think about not just the technological change that engineers create, but how that plays out in a broader societal context. <clears throat> yeah, I'll just add to that. I mean, because I've, I've had uh, sort of different things. One is in terms of uh, losing out on the physical touch and, and things like that. So, you know, we are trying to do things where students do, you know, things in the lab and then in the cloud lab. Um, but there's also different levels because at a certain point, you're not going to be able to do something in the cloud lab unless you have the domain knowledge to do that. Um, on the other hand, uh, this summer and, and now I'm working with a, 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 a student, not a student, he, he was a former student, he's a PhD and he graduated with his PhD from the chemistry department a few years ago. Uh, he's a brilliant uh, a computer uh, computational uh, chemist, um, but he has muscular dystrophy. He's not, he's always lived in his wheelchair, but now he can actually run experiments right? Um, and that would not have been possible. And, you know, because of the way he can interact through the computer, um, he can actually do things and he doesn't necessarily need that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so, you know, having that, you know, the, the, that experience, physical experience, I'm coming around to thinking that it may not be totally necessary. It will be necessary because we always need people who need who uh, know how to build instruments, uh, but that's a whole different aspect. Well, that's a, that's very touching to hear, and that's that's a great story. I um, I was planning to ask, you know, are are the cloud labs making computational researchers consider doing experiments for themselves? I myself was a computational researcher who didn't want to pour liquids. I was, I was terrible at that. Um, but that's great that we're even seeing examples of this technology is bringing a higher accessibility to those practices. Okay, well, um, it looks like we're at time. So uh, thank you all again for um, being here as the panel, Das, Michael, and Saeed. So for now, um, this, this wraps up our first session. We're gonna go ahead and take a 15 minute break. So um, feel free and come back uh, around 1040 and we'll get started with our second session. In format. Each speaker will be given a, give a short talk, then we'll have some time for one or two questions. After all three talks, the speakers will be invited back for a panel Q&A. If you have any questions that might be good for all of the speakers, please hold those for the panel Q&A. And all of your questions should be put in the Q&A box. Our next session is focused on open science and communities, both open data for use by communities and community generated open source resources. We do have one program change in this session. Unfortunately, Janelle Knox Hayes could not be here. We have three great talks lined up, and our speakers are Monica Granados, Taiwo Lasisi, and Melvika Sharin. Our first speaker is Monica Granados, an assistant director at Creative Commons, working on the Open Climate Campaign. Monica, whenever you're ready. I think Monica is still trying to get into the meeting, so we're going to start with Taiwo, actually. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'm actually here if you, depending on who you want to start with first. I managed to get in through the general link. 
So oh, Chago, okay. you want to start first? You, you let me know. <laughs> Whatever you prefer. <laughs> okay, I'll go. <laughs> Thanks, Taiwo. All right, hi everybody, sorry about that. Um, my name is Monica Granados. I, as um, was introduced, I'm an assistant director at Creative Commons. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the pieces that we need in open policy to solve the world's greatest challenges. So I want to start with this big statement that we have here at Creative Commons, and it's really the ethos of the Open Climate Campaign, which is if we're going to solve the world's biggest problems, then the knowledge about them must be open. A great example is what happened in 2020. At the end of 2019, the World Health Organization realized that there was something happening in China. There was a number of cases of pneumonia of an unknown origin. This was really localized initially to uh, certain regions in China and then ultimately the country of China. But eventually it was labeled a pandemic, meaning that everyone in the world was affected by this outbreak. COVID-19 affected us all. I don't think there's any human on earth that wasn't somehow affected either gravely or at least minorly by this new virus. And something really interesting happened because there was a recognition that we were facing something that we probably hadn't faced in a hundred years. That was when the last really big pandemic uh, came to, uh, you know, came to bear. What normally were pretty closed practices all of a sudden became pretty openly shared information and as quickly as possible because there was a reaction to the fact that everyone on earth was being affected by COVID-19. China publicly shared the genetic sequence of COVID-19. The National Science and Technology Advisors from a dozen countries called for open access to COVID-19 publications. And researchers responded, 77% of COVID-19 related papers are open access. Journals responded by making their COVID-19 related papers open access with no fee to publish. There was also a uh, recognition that preprints were a pretty good outlet for us to be able to disseminate information not only freely, but very rapidly. You didn't have to wait for the 12 months that your paper has to go through through the usual scholarly communication pipeline. All of that ended up resulting in a lot of information about COVID-19, having that information as, as easily uh, accessible as possible and generated treatments and helped us develop a vaccine to COVID-19. What was once pretty close practices became open because there was recognition that this is a world level problem. And to solve that challenge, the information about the problem needed to be open. But open sharing of research is really not the default. Uh, here's just a, a snapshot that I've grabbed from uh, the United States and Canada. If you take the authors from the for papers from the United States, only about 41% of those are open. From Canadian authors, only about 38% are open. Also not really using open repositories. Um, there was a paper that came out from Federer and colleagues in 2018 that after the implementation at PLOS One of the data availability statements that required you to state where your data was available, only 20% of those actually had data in a repository. So how do we move towards open? How do we move towards recognizing that we need to have all knowledge be as accessible as possible say for you know privacy or indigenous data or uh, you know species at risk data, for example, how do we get access to 
that knowledge. And particularly in cases where we're trying to tackle world level problems. So I really like to think about it in three ways or three, you know, three avenues that we need to have and then they need to work in concert to, to get us towards open. The first is training. A lot of researchers don't really even know that open practices are available to them. Many have misconceptions about the costs of open access and using repositories. So training is a really important component and it could happen at the institutional level, but also there are many organizations, including some from colleagues that uh, we'll hear from today, like Open Life Science that provide training for researchers. It's really about how do we connect them with existing training and resources so they know that open access is open access and open science and open knowledge is an available method for them. We also need to support it with infrastructure. There needs to be a place for people to put their uh, preprint and there needs to be a place for them to be able to put their uh, author accepted manuscript into uh, a repository. There needs to be a place for that data that has critical information to be accessible to others. And there needs to be investment and, and again, at multiple levels at you know, your institution level, at the national level, at the international level, recognition that to support open, we need infrastructure. But what I really wanna to talk to you today about is the policy aspect. The third is incentives and rewards. We absolutely have to change the way that we reward scientists and researchers on the research that they produce. Right now, they're incentivized not to do things openly. That's why we see those statistics. That's why we see 20%. That's why we see 38%. There are no incentives right now to practice openly or the ones that do exist, they're unaware of. So linking that back to training. So one of the things that we need to think about is how do we change tender and reward structures? How do we change policies to encourage a culture change towards open? So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about open access policies and, the, and what an open access policy should look like. An open access policy or an open science policy is something that is being uh, more and more used by national governments and funders and international organizations to encourage producers of knowledge to work openly. What usually the, pol the policy will say is that if you're going to take uh, money from this organization to do your research, then a stipulation is that you have to make the work open. But open is a really big word. What do we mean by open? How can we oper operationalize that open into something that is equitable and functional and effective? This is a snapshot from the second plan for, uh, uh, for French open science. You'll see that there's a couple of different uh, high level headings here. I wanna point out three pieces that are absolutely crucial to uh, a policy in order for it to be effective in getting us moving towards open that is equitable and effective. The first is, you know, you'll see a provision for open access. You'll see requiring open licenses. And you'll see that I'm going to talk, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what do we mean by open data deposit. So starting with open access, again, open is a really big word. Open may just mean free to read. We want to go more than just free to read. We want access to be immediate, no embargo and to stipulate that there are many, in fact, more options for free open access where there is no cost either to the reader or to the author of the manuscript. Preprint, as I mentioned, again, was a, a tool that was used a lot by researchers during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a version of the manuscript that not, has not finished the review process, but there is a lot of infrastructure that's being built on top of preprints to allow for review, to allow for ultimate uh, uh, creation of versions of records on top of a preprint base. Absolutely free for you to upload that to many different 
uh, preprint repositories that are specific to your discipline. Green open access, that is being used a, a lot presently where you're putting your, um, your manuscript into a, uh, your formatted or sometimes unformatted manuscript, but it has gone through the peer, peer review process into a repository. Here, we're really talking about how do we make sure that it's the author accepted manuscript and that there is no embargo. Using tools like rights retention, keeping hold of your copyright so that you can take your product, your intellectual property and put it into a repository as soon as it is accepted. And increasingly we're hearing more and more about Diamond Open Access where it really serves similar to the traditional scholarly communication workflow, except that there is no cost to publish openly. The, um, the costs to publish are borne through uh, government funds, uh, private funds, um, or sort of collective funds to make sure that the auth neither the author nor the reader pays. We also wanna make sure we, so to, to bring all that together, it's important that rights retention is part of that policy, making sure that authors know that they have to keep their rights because that enables this entire ecosystem. If you sign over your rights to the publisher, you no longer have that ability or the right to use these other forms of open access, at least not immediately. We also wanna make sure that that paper or the data has an open license, again, if it's free to read, it doesn't completely allow the data and information to live to its full potential, to be able to re be remixed or reused or translated or text and data mined. You want to make sure that your policy requires an open license that stipulates that you want this information or this data to be reused, not just read. It, you want it to allow for the full reuse of the publication and data like I said, for text and data mining and in a standardized format that enables machine readability. Lastly, we wanna make sure that there's a way to, to deposit open data or requiring open data and then providing examples of what infrastructure you can use to deposit your open data. There are many institutional repositories that you may have available to you, but you also can search for a repository to use in the registry of research data depositories repositories they have a very neat tool that allows you to actually look for the subdiscipline if you want to look for a very specific repository where you know your colleagues will go looking for that data we're taking all of this and integrating it in at the open climate campaign where we're working to create policies with national governments environmental organizations uh, to make work open through policies. Climate change is not open right now. We wanna make sure that it gets opened. And this can happen at many levels, including at your institution. Here's an example from the University of Ottawa that shows that at the institutional level, you can create open access policies that can be implemented. You don't have to wait for your national government to do it. Just more information about the Open Climate Campaign at this website. And thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, so we do have a question in our Q&A. And the question is, uh, but who is paying for this open access when impact factors are so often important in certain disciplines? Yeah, so to answer that, the, the question, so if, if, there, if there's, no article there's no article processing charge required for uh, a preprint, or if you're depositing, for example, an author accepted manuscript. So let's say if you retain your rights to your paper and you're part of an institution that requires you to retain your rights, so you've got that sort of organizational backing behind you, and you publish in a high impact journal, like say you're publishing in Nature, you got a really cool study in, in Nature, by retaining your rights, you can still put a version, a formatted version or unformatted version, most likely if it's an author accepted manuscript, into an institutional repository for free, and it can appear with no paywall in that institutional repository, and it could still appear on nature.com as well, so that you're still getting the benefit of, you know, having a, a paper in nature. Really, it's important for me to express that there are so many ways to do open, 
and still support the important research that you're doing and the incentives that are uh, that that require you to to be publishing in certain outlets. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I think that we'll go ahead and move on to our next speaker. And if you have any additional questions from Monica, you can put them in the um, Q&A for the panel session. So our next speaker is Taiwo Lasisi. She is the CLIR Postdoctoral Fellow in Community Data Literacy at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. Whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, I'll just go ahead and share my slides. Hi, can you all see my slides good? Just to be sure. Yep. Okay. okay so good morning. Um, my name is Taiwo um, Lassisi and my presentation um, title today is Creating Community Data um, with Community Access for Community Needs. Um, I, I have, you know, segmented uh, this talk today into three categories. Um, I'm not oblivious that a lot has been and will be spoken about open science and open access data today. And um, I will um, briefly speak on how community data can be created with community members. Um, and in this context, um, community data um, I would conceptualize it as any form of evidence or information um, that is relevant to um, local communities. Um, after this, I would um, briefly touch on community access um, to community data and how that can be facilitated. And lastly, I would um, you know, speak on community data and how we can effectively position that um, for the use of the communities. Um, so, Communities across um, the U.S. Uh, face an array of complex challenges, you know, community development challenges, especially, and addressing this usually re require um, a robust collaboration, you know, to create um, valid data um, that can facilitate community actions. Um, international organizations um, here like um, UNESCO have also identified creating um, knowledge systems and data that can help um, advance local communities. Um, one, one of the ways to create such data is through a subdivision of open science um, that I, I know some of us are you know, very familiar with, and that's called citizen science. And this basically involves um, the collection and analysis of data relating to our natural world, you know, by members of um, the community or the general public, um, which is usually a part of a collaborative project with um, professional scientists or researchers. Um, some of the ways that researchers um, that we, you know, really can help advance citizen science is through community engagement and recurrent outreaches on the work that we actually do, you know, our ongoing projects and create awareness in order to facilitate um, community participation. And one thing I would, you know, also say when it comes to creating community data with communities is, you know, define um, and define, um, define what your project is about, define what you want to do. So that way, um, community members can get acquainted with your project well enough, uh, you know, that those who are interested um, are able to partner with you. Another way to create useful community data is through community review. Um, I'm currently working on a collaborative project uh, with some other Clare Fellows um, from John Hopkins um, University and the University of Virginia, to mention a few. And what we're really trying to do is that we are trying to explore the concepts of um, community review. And um, this can involve um, including community champions or community members as study participants. And then as our project, you know, are ongoing or after the completion of the project, we send um, our project or report back to them to give their opinions, more like you know a community peer review. And that way we would you know help participants to look into the study 
and review it to be sure that it you know conveys their ideas and their perspectives and that way even you know our end result the end product of our research um will be improved um in quality um because it really and truly conveys um the heart of the community we are um hoping to serve so um open access data is crucial to community members and partners because you know it helps empower um, communities and um, build their capacity when it comes to um, knowledge accessibility. And one of the questions that um, always come up um, and um, we always hear it um, often is, what does it mean for communities to have access? Um, this can come in many ways. This can you know, um, be seen in different ways, especially because um, not every member of the community are trying to achieve the same thing. So in facilitating um, open community data, one of the crucial things is to prioritize being descriptive in a way that it would translate to multiple community audiences. You know, For instance, when talking about data management or um, metadata, it is, you know, pivotal um, that we consider the question of how we are making sure data is not just reproducible um, from the um, aspect of open science, um, which means useful for other researchers, but also um, trying to understand um, what it means um, for data to be useful for community members who do not have our backgrounds. So the question would be, how are we making sure that community data or data for the community is accessible, not just from um, open access um, perspective of open science, but in a way that community members can you know, understand it. Um, so I would also quickly mention um, that um, I would like to quickly touch on the issue of integrating community voice um, in data sharing and policy reform activities. Um, we have really seen that in the past years, um, the progress at which you know, states and um, community-based organizations have developed and advocated for um, data sharing initiatives across sectors um, have you know, increased. We've seen how it has moved forward, however, However, community members are um, often not included in these efforts. Although um, recently um, I've seen that um, an example of what I've seen recently is that the Robert um, Hood Johnson Foundation's um, learning and action and policy and partnerships initiatives um, have you know, taken it up and um, groups like the Center of Healthcare Strategies are working with states and community-based organizations and, and you know, community members. Um, and I want to emphasize um, that community members, um, they are not only working with community organizations, but, you know, actual local people, the community members to kind of like integrate community voice in data sharing and policy reform activities to better understand um, um, their project at hand, which is um, health equity challenges. Um, this particular um, efforts and project portrays um, to me um, how community voice um, can be prioritized and integrated in accessibility of community data. Um, now, thinking about um, community needs, um, some of the some of the um, benefits of providing. Now we just uh, okay, yeah, yes. So thinking about community needs, some of the benefits of um, providing community data uh, with community access um, is that it provides um, community stakeholders with access to scientific data. And, you know, it also increases um, citizens' trust um, and, you know, just generally also improve um, their engagement and active participation um, throughout the life, um, the, uh, data, uh, a data life cycle process. And one other thing that um, this also does is it helps, you know, improve um, community storytelling and whether they want to use that in form of in form of grant writing or just to pitch their ideas. And it also helped them, you know, um, as a result, communicate effectively their project outcomes. And I'll get into that just in a little bit. So when it comes to storytelling, um, community based 
organizations um can um can make use of community data to you know bring up a strong case um for things like um grant proposals um like I mentioned or facilitate other you know projects you know they can use such community data either it is you know qualitative or quantitative to make a good story for themselves um by adding statistical facts you know or qualitative quotations um that support um the community project and and currently i just actually um i taught um just yesterday um a workshop on um community data and storytelling and how you know community partners or you know people who are involved in community research can integrate data storytelling um, and um, link it to the organizational goals in, in terms of creating a strong proposal and anything related to um, their community needs or project goals. Um, so when it comes to um, communicating project outcomes, um, like I mentioned, community organization and partners who do scholarly work um, um, can are able to um, get more clarity because um, for project communication and set realistic demands and expectations because of the um, data knowledge um, that they have at hand. And that um, I think that is a very powerful thing, being able to link um, the data you have at hand um, in your communication um, to the public uh, or to um, your audience as the case may be. And um, I think one last thing that I would like to make sure that I mention here um, is that uh, one of the questions that we should, you know, as scholars or as researchers, as professionals, you know, should be asking community researchers is how are community members using data? You know, within community members, there are those who are citizen scientists who just want to do research or use data for analytics. But... There are also um, community groups and members who want to assess data because they just want to understand the data. So having this knowledge can help uh, um, you know, us researchers um, venture into projects and create data that actually supports diverse community needs. And this will also help us blur you know, the disconnect between community data creation um, um, and actually you know, meeting the community needs. And I would just quickly mention that um, the three categories that I've mentioned today, um, it's really a vicious like, circle, you know, the community needs um, um, can, can define the kind of community data created and that can translate into trying to ensure community access, which, you know, goes back to um, identifying um, new needs of community members based on their current knowledge of data and their unique um, abilities and experiences. Um, so uh, with that, I would I would say, you know, please, um, these are some of the projects I'm currently working on and working with community members. I'm exploring the effects of flooding in Pittsburgh. So please feel free to reach out. And I'm also teaching some workshops that I've, I mean, they're over this um, semester, but please feel free to reach out in the spring and I can give you more information on them if you want to um, learn more on them. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, any questions for Taiwan, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Um, I'll just start. I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about the initial outreach to impact the community members. Um, so how do we find these partners and how do we ensure we're reaching out in an equitable and accessible way? Yeah, um, I think one thing that is um, very important is for us, especially researchers or professionals, uh, is willing to actually go out there like when I, you know, came into um, CMU and I wanted to start my journey of finding community partners, I actually started, you know, attending their forums, you know, going into their town hall meetings and just engaging, just, you know, facilitating that communication, making sure they know what I am doing and why I'm here and how they can collaborate with CMU and do amazing work, you know. So just put yourself out there, you know, as a professional, as a researcher, so they can know what you're doing and genuinely also care about them, what they are doing and, you know, seek for ways to collaborate where it's mutually beneficial. Thank you so much. I think that's a really, really important point connecting. Um, I think we'll go ahead and move on to our, our next speaker. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. 
Um, so our next speaker is Malika Sharin, a senior researcher for the Tools, Practices, and Systems Research Program at the Alan Turing Institute in London and co-lead of the Turing Way Project, uh, which we're big fans of here at CMU. Uh, whenever you're ready, Malvika. Thank you so much for having me here. Really delighted to always hear who's using the Turing Way and who's reading the Turing Way and who's building the Turing Way. So thank you so much for all your contribution. Um, I am going to mainly talk about the Turing Way, but in a way that it makes sense that the Turing Way isn't just a project, but it's a vehicle to build community and connect communities. It's an open source, open science project and a community driven handbook on data science and research practices. Our goal is to involve and support community of uh, diverse actors in terms of data science and research and um, together build reproducible ethical and collaborative practices for everyone. Let me just start similar to what Monica was saying. What is it that we are trying to address? What are some world's biggest problem and how can open science actually contribute to that? Um, the goal of open science is not openness itself. This is something that I believe when we're building community and working with them in resources that they can use. It's not just about creating something, but really about achieving knowledge equity for diverse actors who can not just access, access is great, but they should have a say in production and setting the direction of knowledge building. In this space, I want to um, also that over the years that I have been working in open science and with the Turing Way community, we have really actively tried to align our work with knowledge commons. The so knowledge commons can be defined as information, data, and content that is collectively owned and managed by the community of users without depleting their quantity or quality. Digital common is a part of knowledge commons, uh, which is about global digital resources produced and maintained together in a decentralized manner. So the Creative Commons is actually a classic example of that. Collective and decentralization is achieved through promoting licensing, authorship, peer production, governance, participatory way to foster equitable access to resource, which is a very resounding definition of open science. So participatory process to manage any common for shared benefit is called commoning. There is no commons without commoning. A common always requires community, people who care about, who can or want to access the common, and the resources that they have, as well as a governance, which is a set of care, a set of rules for carrying the resources, as well as for the community members around them. Very aligned to that, uh, the Turing Way is a digital common, uh, which is a book, which is a public resource, an open source community that accesses and supports the project. We value and support the um, idea of openness, the diversity of knowledge that people bring, as well as the local, lo local realities that each of our contributors bring. We foster a community that take the advocacy and intervention work, not just about writing chapters, but how they push forward a conversation in their own community to achieve collaboration, equity, and access and knowledge system. The Turing Way started as a book on reproducible research in 2019. Uh, the initial group of people who came together were writing about computational reproducibility mainly, thinking about what does it mean to build open source tools, practices, and systems? How do we apply version control, licensing? How can we apply research data management uh, approaches, code quality, code testing, and so on? But of course, we have heard from previous speakers uh, in the session today, it's just not about one thing or other, it's not just about the technology itself. There are so many things that is associated around how we achieve openness and reproducibility. So reproducibility is one of the goals and in the way that we do openly allows people to look at the processes, but it just has to start from the very beginning and go through the life cycle of research. In that process, we are also actively thinking with our community about uh, practices for project design. How do we communicate it for people of diverse knowledge, how can we make sure that people understand it, knowledge written isn't just accessible, how can we ensure that people can communicate about it in their own communities, uh, building a collaborative practices within the community of the Turing Way, but also extrapolating that in the research infrastructure. Thinking about ethical consideration, uh, at what stages should we apply them? And of course, it's not just a one-time effect, it's something that needs to be integrated throughout. 
as well as we maintain a community handbook, ensuring that all the practices that we are applying in the Turing way can be reproduced by someone else in building different communities. The project was started by Kirsty, um, and I joined uh, just a few months later. Now I co-lead this project with her. The community managers, Anne-Lee Steele, and our project managers, Alexandra Araujo Alvarez. Uh, the project has been running for over four years, over 300 chapters, many, many resources in there. And I also want to acknowledge that the project is supported by uh, the Alan Turing Institute, where we are based. It's a National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence in the UK. But this is also to disclaim that although you see these spaces a lot, these are just enablers of the work that's happening in the community. The actual work is done itself. These are individuals from different organizations all across the world who have come together to share practices from their own communities and projects that they are involved in. So here I want to kind of leave a nugget of messages that we have learned through building the Turing Way. And one of the biggest one is open science progresses open science. Uh, op the purpose of open science, again, is not confined in one community that we work in. It's about the ripple effect that it creates. Open science also allows us the infrastructure through which we build these kind of work. It's a process for development, maintenance, and sustainability of digital commons while we make sure that people involved in it share the benefits. The project has grown quite a lot. Um, we have over 450 direct contributors to the project, uh, 5,000 monthly users. Uh, we have been building governance in different ways, and we have over 25 core members involved in the development of it. In the last couple of years, we have also received some recognitions, uh, been referenced in a lot of peer-reviewed articles, thousands of uh, different resources that people have referenced us. But also, they, there are many communities and projects that are built on the model of the Turing Way. So Turing Way has kind of built in solidarity with other projects where people, rather than explaining what the Turing Way already has, they build case studies uh, in their respective domains. So for example, we have um, environmental data science book, which is creating case studies on environmental data, and at the same time, referencing back to the Turing Way for practices that they need their users to learn about. I am also a co-director for open, open Life Science and also involved in various communities. And the Turing Way has become one of the places where we can convene these different communities and involve them in conversation that we all care about. So you can find all the resources that you would be hearing about on Zenodo, but um, you can also find us in social media and there's other spaces. And I really invite you to connect with us. The project is developed openly on GitHub, um, and we also recognize that GitHub already comes with its own barriers. We also provide lots of training in how you can use GitHub or version control or different kinds of technology that we have applied. And our, um, our sneaky purpose for doing that is that by the process of getting involved in the Turing way, people understand what it is to apply open source, open science practices. And uh, they can use the Turing Way as a playing field, bringing back all the practices that they see and experience into their own work. Just to give shout out to some of the resources that we use a lot, of course, thanks to Zenodo infrastructure maintainers who allow us persistent identifiers. So all the things that we are sharing with the community can be centralized in one location. Uh, we are using, of course, Git, Jupyter, Book, Finder, and different kind of bots in order to make our resources uh, useful and welcoming and accessible. We are also hosting the book itself on Netlify. I showed you that we have like five guides and community handbook and 450 uh, people writing over hundreds of chapters. And it is quite overwhelming. If you have never seen the Turing way, there's just too much. And often I say that you don't know what you don't know. So maybe begin with something that you want to know right now, either something that you're working on currently or something that you want to learn about to apply in your own work right now. And then by default, you would also browse different things around it and you would learn about different practices that you may not know um, originally. However, this is also a place for you to see, is there any practice that you know that you think the community should learn about and if there's a gap in the Turing way that you can help us develop. We understand that the book like this can get outdated, especially in data science, as practices are evolving very constantly. We want to acknowledge that five years down the line, the practices we are sharing today may not be fully relevant. So the book is book, book should be taken as a work in progress. 
book belongs to the community. The community belongs to the community. Everything that we do is really for and with the community. This is not a Turing project, the Turing Institute, although we get lots of support and uh, financial investment into maintaining and developing it. As I said, this is a work in progress, which is evolving with the needs in the community. We are creating the resources together. It's, it's about the way, how we do things together, the journey and not the set of rules. Anything that's written in the book is um, can change and you can change it. Um, so this is just a nice uh, map of where the book is being used, uh, which is worldwide, which is really fantastic to see, which also makes us believe that uh, resources like this, digital common like the Turing Way is quite an important resource for maintaining and perpetuating the practices that we wanna see. We also have community members who are translating the book. So we should not forget that the book is written in English, not the entire world speaks English, or not at least as their primary language. And we have some really fantastic uh, people in our community who have been translating the book and not just translating text to text. It's really about contextualizing, internationalizing, also building cultural awareness among us by making sure that we're not just um, advancing the English hegemony, but also thinking about what does it mean for users who are not originally involved in the development of a technology. They use Crowdin for localizing all the translation materials and some languages that they are working on currently are Arabic, Turkish, um, Portuguese, Spanish, and French. And you can definitely come and join us, not just to translate the Turing way. There are many communities who are doing translation work also come and work with us. So we need to provide these pathways clearly. It's not just to say that here is a book, you can do it, you can work on it, you can use it. It's really about being intentional about do people really know how to get involved. So our community members are working really hard to make sure that people get onboarded, they have different ways to contribute and use the book, their concerns are resolved, They're, they are uh, heard and listened to when we are not doing well uh, in terms of justifying the practices or, or they should be able to challenge us. So some of the easy way people can get involved is of course fixing links and helping us fix any uh, typo, making sure that their resources are represented in the book. The book's purpose is not to reinvent the wheel, it's to centralize the practices that other people should know. We have committee member reading and reviewing each other's work. Uh, we are also translating, as I mentioned, but also mainly to think about what are some best practices from your community that you would like your committee members to know. There are many work that are happening. Of course, the book has become one of the ways to uh, share with the world, but the community is where a lot of activism and intervention work is happening. So beyond translation, we have people who have been working on research infrastructure role by um, making case for how different kinds of roles should be formalized in ins institutions so they can prioritize open science practices and integrate those considerations in the project. Um, they have also published paper uh, recently called Manifesto for Open Research Infrastructure Roles. We have many people who are doing training and outreach based on the Turing Way resources. We have infrastructure maintainers who've been making sure that our book doesn't break and that we are making it accessible and useful for everyone. We have a group of accessibility working group. We have an environmental data science book. Uh, we also have our um, yearly book dash sprints and events and lots of different things that you would hear about. And I'm currently working on something called Practitioners Hub, where we are working with specific uh, organization from different sectors who can share the practices of open science from their respective sectors and tell us how the Turing Way uh, can be useful for their own work. The purpose of creating different kinds of pockets of work is to decentralize power. These people are the leaders in the community. It's not just the four, four faces that I showed in the beginning. It's not about just informing that you should read the book and apply it, but making sure that these people can collaborate with us and in fact, they can lead it in their own world. It is also extremely important for us to uh, think about acknowledgement and incentives, something that previous speakers have already touched on. We recognize it very strongly that open science or open source in the past have built on the work of volunteer labor. and That's not sustainable. And it's also been recognized that it's not just about who gets acknowledged at the moment in research. There are many, many kinds of work that's happening in the community that just does not, does not get the same recognition and stays hidden. And in fact, the work that stays hidden often marginalizes the marginalized communities even more because these people are behind the care infrastructure of the community. 
So we are trying to reimagine what recognition for all contributors in the Turing way looks like. And from that, can we build processes that other communities can take forward? Some of the easy way we look is um, all contributors bot. It's a bot that you can install in your own uh, GitHub repository. You can give uh, credit to anybody who has contributed to your work, um, not just the, those people who push code on the GitHub directly. But we also have a narrative uh, record where people can go and write about what they are doing. They each get dedicated link that they can use in their CV. Finally, all the people who contribute to the Turing way are listed as authors. It's not about the quantity of contribution, it's the quality of contribution that we want to recognize. But, but again, we have been talking about purpose a lot. Um, and the reason for, for talking about open science purpose and that also recognizing that it goes beyond openness is because we want to build foundational skills for people and give them tools and practices through this openness. Academia places huge em emphasis on outcomes, but open science practices are integral throughout the research process to achieve those outcomes. It's worth remembering that openness does not work in vacuum. It requires combined approach that takes reproducibility, ethics, collaborative and inclusive approaches at all stages. You can do open and unethical research or collaborative and ethical close research, but putting it all together takes skills, mentorship and understanding. Um, it's not about doing everything all at once. It's about taking the right step at the right time. These are together considered as foundational skill. This is something that we're really trying to push forward through the Turing way. I want to just mention OLS, uh, formerly Open Life Science, uh, which I'm a co-director for. It's a training and mentoring program and a capacity building organization. Um, it, this is one of the places where people don't know how to apply specific open science practices into their own project can come and learn with us. We uh, offer four months free training program. We also offer micro grant and honoraria for anybody who involves in this work. This is a different way of doing open science because it is nonprofit. It allows us to be a lot more flexible than an institutional way. Well, finally, I'm going to take a deep breath and I want to um, kind of give you one message if you want to take this away. It should be to recognize that open science is a way to transform the way we conduct our research. In an era where we're facing a lot of challenges globally, ranging from pandemic and climate change, natural disaster and conflicts, we need to acknowledge that open practices is our duty as researchers and members of our society. The many facets that we learn about open science should not be taken as restriction or distraction, but as a scientific freedom. We all can learn, unlearn, challenge, dismantle, and rebuild research infrastructure that prioritizes reproducible, ethical, and collaborative, collaborative research for collective benefit. Through this radical reimagination of open science every day, we can actually change the way that we work. So with that, I would like to thank all the people who have helped us come here. Thank you all for inviting me here. Thank you so much, Malvika. Um, any questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Um, I, I have a question for you regarding your point about communicating uh, to community members with diverse knowledge. I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that a bit of what that entails, especially with respect to like researcher responsibilities. Yeah, I think I want to just go to uh, to the opening that uh, Melanie was saying that, you know, we are bringing a very interdisciplinary perspective when we come together as open science practitioners. Suddenly, you know, we're no longer just environmental research or bioinformatician or biologists. We are all thinking about how can we make our work open. So that is that is what I mean when we say, you know, diverse knowledge uh, owner and producer. Um, so we need to sometimes go underneath. So I generally would, I should have shown, we have a sketch about this iceberg where, where on the top we see that there's research outcome and specific people and specific policy. But underneath, we're all doing the same thing, designing our work, integrating our work practices, doing the same processes. It's, it takes some time for us to recognize when we come as interdisciplinary research that we are all doing the same thing, although on the surface, it looks very, very different. Therefore, understanding that differences is um, not that much compared to uh, how we how may, we may have on the face value. I hope that that answers. But it's just it's not as complicated as we see it the moment we start working with different people. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'd love to invite all of the speakers back on screen to answer some questions as a panel.
Um, so we have a question uh, from Tatiana Osova about what are the incentives for individual institutions to develop open science policies? So I think that that question uh, could be for any of our panel members. Yeah, maybe I'll start it first and I'll take a, I'll, I'll, I'll take one perspective and that is like for like advocating for your own researchers. There's been a lot of uh, meta science or research on research to show that open practices actually do end up benefiting researchers themselves and ultimately your institution. So you could look at it from many different perspectives depending on like who your audience is and like who you want to convince that you should you should institute an, uh, a, a policy at, at your academic institution or, or your research institution. So if you're talking to, to researchers, you know, there's a, a clear citation advantage for open uh, articles, and that goes across disciplines. There's been some work from um, Aaron McKiernan and colleagues that have shown that has shown that, you know, there's an overall citation advantage and then really across disciplines as well. So even for, for researchers themselves, you know, you're sort of advocating for them to move towards open and it's better for them. You could also take that up one level and say, it's actually also really good for institutions and, and leadership that uh, your institution has a bigger impact. And I know a lot of these metrics are important to, you know, to, to leadership. And, um, you know, sometimes that matters in terms of like funding decisions, having more impact of the work that is being done at your research institution is good for researchers. It's good for the, um, for the institution itself, for the, you know, for the uh, impact that is of the research that's happening at that, at that own institution. Um, so that's one perspective. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to my panelists to, to talk about others. And, and I think I would just, you know, quickly add that, that um, being an institution and facilitating open science also, you know, it just it just helps with um engaging with the communities you know around us you know as a university or as any type of institution so we are talking about um facilitating um collaboration and in this um aspect we are talking about even cross sector collaboration from the university to the community and you know that that would also you know attract um diverse stakeholders um to the university and that way we might even get to venture into other valuable projects. So, if I may add to that, I think um, it's less about individual organization building their open science policy, but the implementation framework, because um, at the you know higher level, nationally speaking, a lot of countries are trying to build uh, policies based on you know cross country. Um, but the implementation itself is very important for institution to invest on because there are a lot of people who are doing open science, but they're doing in a fragmented way, unsupported and undelivered a lot of their vision. So our libraries are doing a huge service to try to bring, bring them together and that needs to have investment on. And these kind of policies really helps them in getting that investment and support that they need. Thank you, all of you, for the for those answers. And I, I think the next question touches on a little bit of where you were going, Malvika. Um, and that question is, are there any federal changes that you believe need to happen to implement some of the open science policies that have been suggested? This is something that I suppose Monica and Taiwo would be better to speak on, but I want to begin by saying that I feel like things are happening. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of work has happened so far on the grassroots level. Communities have been have been acting as activists and we're still, but now suddenly, let's say a year of open science gets launched and uh, your government says that within the next five years, you have to open everything and, and funders have been mandating it. And suddenly it is, it is a priority for everyone. It's no longer a bunch of grassroots activists trying to shout uh, on the street. So I feel like those kind of you know policy and and uh, government mandate definitely helps. But I'm going to pass it to Monica and Taiwan. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, as Monica said, we wouldn't. I don't think we would have the 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 Nelson memo, which is that um, it, it it was a memo handed down by the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, requiring that all 
federal departments and agencies put together their own specific policy that uh, requires immediate and free open access to um, publications and, and data that are being produced by those uh, those departments and agencies. Uh, that would not have happened without that grassroots support. That wouldn't have happened with like work like work that was that's been happening at at Spark, um, at Creative Commons, the Turing Way. All of it like that momentum wouldn't wouldn't have been there to you know to push the decision makers to to mandate that. It is, however, important how that gets executed. So the the memo is very broad. It says you know you need free, immediate, open access to to like data and and publications. How that gets implemented can really have a different effect on researchers and on, on community members. If if we don't have specific language, you know, as I mentioned in 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 my talk where you know, we're looking at rights retention, where we're looking at specifically the many different avenues for open access, that open access does not equal article processing charges, that there are many free ways to get your publication open and again, still sort of um, allow you to publish wherever journal that you decide is the most appropriate place for you to publish your work. We need to have that, you know, that those specifics in the policies that get created for each department and agency. And it's going to be a challenge because I think yesterday I was on a uh, another webinar and there's something like 400 different departments and agencies that like the that the um, OMB actually doesn't even know how many departments and agencies exist in the federal government because it's so big. So how do you make sure? that each of those policies, you know, like work with the other policies within, you know, sort of those 400 organizations and that like they center um, ways in doing open in an equitable way, because what happens here in the United States will have a really big impact across the world as well. So if the US moves to paying article processing charges as a default, that's going to make a very equitable, inequitable situation for other countries that cannot follow suit, that cannot afford to pay ten thousand dollars to make something open. And and I will just um quickly add to that um in terms of um thinking about even um open reviews, you know, and open evaluations and things like that. Um, because um I feel I'm 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 a community junkie. I like to see that um community voice is being integrated, you know, in these things. And um that was one of the things I was mentioning in my presentation in terms of kind of like a community peer review, giving the community a voice to actually be able to say, to have a say in be it, you know, data sharing or policy reform, I think that would, you know, also have, you know, a significant impact. Thank you very much. Um, this has been talk, touched on a bit throughout, but I'm wondering if any of you want to elaborate a little bit on what changes you would like to see in research practices, policies, et cetera, uh, that would increase uh, more global accessibility of, of the research. I've been thinking a lot about this, and, and I think I always blame it to my own identity. I am an Indian with a citizenship from Europe and living in London. I do not belong to a community, and I cannot think, uh, sorry, not belong to a country. I belong to too many communities. I don't belong to a country, which means I can't think for one single country. I need to think for multiple countries, and having that experience of lots of privilege that I have here versus my colleagues in India who don't have access to the degree that I do, I need to think about how can we build a borderless open science and not so much about that this is our national mandate. We need to think about how does it affect the rest of the world. Very, very much what Monica was talking about, that we don't need a pandemic to remind us that problems are universal. Well, and also, I'll just really add to that is, and, and I think that goes um, um from what you're talking about, it goes to uh, the point of, you know, how people um, ranging from the federal government, you know, to, you know, local leaders and, you know, community champions, are they, you know, willing to invest, you know, in making this universal? 
I think that's really the point. Like we can um talk about it um as much as we want to, but um we need people who are willing to kind of like help build capacity and invest in and I would I would dare to say that this might not necessarily when we are talking about you know making this internationally available this might not necessarily have um a direct benefit to the investors but um at a point of just you know wanting to see our our world thrive we need to you know have people who are willing to you know invest to facilitate this Yeah, I'll just echo what I would just said. It's like investing in like the people, but investing in the idea as as well. Um, I, you know, I work for a a nonprofit that is grant funded, and every year we have to go out and see who wants to support what what we think is a public good. Like the licenses are a public good, and every year we have to go out and like convince people that we need these licenses and they need to be, uh, there needs to be stewardship around them. There isn't, you know, consistent funding that goes in to do this type of work. And so it's draining. It's, and then I know all like, you know, or I know for sure maybe you could talk about like from your experience from OLS, like what it's like to go out there and like, you know, grind out going and, and convincing people to fund something that is like, is a public good. And so having reframing our, idea of like how we maintain these like these systems that really should be considered a public good and we should have like investment from 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 national government and continued investment uh to to maintain these infrastructures and the people that build community that that build tools that maintain tools Thank you so much. Thanks for this uh, really important uh, discussion. And I think that we've cleared out all our questions. So we'll go ahead and break for lunch. Uh, we'll take about an hour and come back at 1 p.m. Eastern time for our session on federal and institutional policies. Thanks again, everyone. For those of us, for those that are just joining us, uh, my name is Melanie Ganey. I'm the director of the Open Science and Data Collaborations Program at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. Our next session is going to be about the impact of policies. And we've already talked about policies quite a bit today. Um, these themes are very overlapping. But in particular, the session will address the impact of policies from the federal government, as well as institutions and departments. Um, and as I said before, we've never really um, done a full session dedicated to this topic in the past, so we're really excited about this. Um, as a reminder, if you're just joining us, the way that this session will work is that we will have um, three talks that are about 15 minutes each. There will be time um, to ask a couple quick questions for each speaker after their talk. And then when they're done, we'll invite all of them back on screen to answer some questions together in a panel Q&A. So if you have any questions that are more general or might be addressed by more than one of our speakers, you might choose to hold on to those until the panel. Um, so with that, um, we are ready to get started. Um, our first speaker, speaker is Lakeisha Harris. Lakeisha is the Dean for the School of Graduate Studies and Research, where she has oversight of the university's 28 graduate programs and is the co-lead of the Institutional and Departmental Policy Language Working Group at Helios. Um, and with, and you can um, share your slides when you're ready, Lakeisha. Okay, hi everyone, thank you so much. I'm working on a new computer, so oh, can everyone see? <laughs> so thank you, Melanie, for the introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. So again, yes, I'm Lakeisha Harris. I am the Dean for the School of Graduate Studies at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, which is a historically Black college um, and university um, on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to give acknowledgement to my co-leads for the Helios um, Institutional and Departmental Policy Working Group. Um, Alzada Tipton, who is the Provost and Dean of the Faculty at Whitman College, 
and Chris Berg, who is the director of libraries at MIT. And the three of us have been working really closely with the Helios team and the other working groups to really dig into um, the policies um, at the universities that we are in um, and how they are affected um, by this move to open science. So part of our goal was to develop a collective action plan for embedding open science into the promotion and tenure process. And as we who work in higher ed, um, we always talk about how important um, the promotion and tenure process is because that is what basically how you are evaluated as a faculty member. And so we want to we we wanted to really look at each of the institutions, um, the differences. As I said, I'm at a historically black college, um, so our mission is different. Um, um, excuse me, Lakeisha. Sorry, we're seeing your slides in presenter mode. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, no worries. <laughs> Let me stop sharing for you. I'm I'm not sure how to quite do that. Hold on, give me one second. Do I just share? Uh, my apologies. Um, I'm not sure how to take that off. That actually looks good. So. Oh, how you see it now? Okay, I think I need to. Keep, does it look better now? Yes. Okay, Perfect. thank you. All right. So yes, my apologies. So my goal, yeah. So again, our goal was to develop a collective action plan while respecting the differences of the universities um, that each of us reside at, um, recognizing the differences between the faculty, the missions, um, the interdisciplinary challenges that we have. Um, we have been engaged in discussions for more than a year now on how to engage our campus stakeholders into this mission of open science. And I can say for, for someone like myself, this was a new discussion for us, um, not new to the system um, in which my university resides, but just new to the university, the idea of open scholarship, um, having conversations with faculty members on campus who were not really open to the idea because they did not quite understand how their um, individual work would be used. And so we've been engaged in a number of um, conversations um, about this over the past year. So to this end, we started off by developing an RPT joint statement um, in which we asked universities to immediately sign on and say that they would engage um, in the process of advancing open scholarship on their universities' campuses. Um, so we talked about the importance of open research and scholarship and, and shaping a positive research culture on campus. Um, we talked about the promotion and tenure process. Uh, many of the universities, um, and, and let me just back up and say, we have more than 80 universities who have signed on to the Helios group to complete this work. So we have um, representatives from a wide range of universities. Um, but what we found during this process, immediately asking people to sign on was not quite the right way to go um, because many were hesitant um, because of the types of universities, um, faculty discussions. Um, as I said, many people were really hesitant to sign on. So we took a step back and said, well, ins instead of asking you to sign on that you will immediately make changes to your promotion and tenure process, how about we just ask you to commit to having those dialogues on campus? And so, um, so far, um, you know, only one university had signed on to say that they would make those changes. Um, and that was Whitman College, which Alzada Tipton is the provost, uh, where she is provost. Um, but we've had a lot more positive discussions about, hey, let's just commit to having the discussion about whether or not we can um, influence our promotion and tenure processes. And so one of the things we did, we, we talked about the, just the components of en engaging the key um, campus partners. And that looks different at every university. Some universities have um, faculty senates. Um, university senate, um, do you start with the faculty? Do you start with the provost? Do you start with the president? And so what we're finding is that everyone has a different way of engaging who those stakeholders are on campus and how important this was. And then we wanna ensure that everyone has the resources that they need in order to um, make these decisions or changes. And so we've 
decided to start having little um, conversations um, where Helios group, Helios leadership is willing to come and talk directly to the university, talk to the faculty, um, developing materials that we can send out to our um, faculty and campus stakeholders, just so they'll understand how important this is. So this is an ongoing process. Okay, let me not go too far. Okay, so in January of 23, the members of the working group um, contrib contributed to an issue brief where we disseminated this information to campus leadership and engaged the stakeholders to really further these campus discussions on open scholarship. And again, as I've stated, we are in various um, we are in various um, parts of that process. Um, I know for me personally, I've started the conversation with our faculty leadership. We have a really strong sh um, shared governance um, body on our campus. And so I know it was important for me to talk to the faculty and university um, faculty leadership and staff groups because this is, impacts everyone. Um, and then we just talked about the core concerns about aligning with emerging federal directors um, in light of the Nelson memo in which the White House um, de determined that or declared that 2023 is the year of open science. And so what I found and just, you know, anecdotal data, um, some of the faculty said, well, I don't want other people seeing my research. I don't want people um, being able to share my results uh, or share my um, work with other people, not really understanding. So as I dig a little uh, more deeply into what the concerns are, um, I'm finding that, you know, some people are hesitant just because of things such as that. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, I have faculty who are saying, yes, I want my research to get out there. We are a smaller university. Um, and, and so, we and we do a lot of great work at our university. Um, and so we we really want the work that we do to be shared widely and openly. And so we're using this opportunity to really show our campus administrators um, that this is really important for us to engage in and for them to um, advocate for resources for us to continue this work. So um, last but not least, so to that end, um, the Helios team applied for a NASA training um, and conference grant, and we're working along um, other professional societies to really bring all of these um, campus leadership um, individuals, so presidents, provosts, to the table. And so in January of 2024, we will be bringing um, presidents um, to Miami, Florida, where they can really learn more about the Helios group, what we're doing and the importance of open scholarship and leading. So we just had a planning meeting. So um, members of the working group, we won't be attending um, the meeting. So it's just reserved for the presidents. And we have about 30 presidents who have signed on. So we're really excited. Um, and so we're continuing to um, advocate for them to come learn more about the group. And so we're hoping that they also, once they get the knowledge that they will be able to share this with their campus stakeholders and we'll have more individuals sharing, um, signing on um, to continue the work of changing our promotion and tenure processes so that um, we can advance the open scholarship. And so I think that was all that I had today. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, we have time for a quick question or two for Lakeisha, if anybody has a question specifically for her in the audience. I have a couple questions, but I think that they would make sense to ask the panel. So I'll, okay. I'll hold on. Um, okay, with that, There'll be more time to um, ask Lakeisha questions if people think of them. And so we will move on to our next speaker. That is Michael Doherty, a professor and chair of the Department of Psychology at the University of Maryland. And you can share your slides. Great. All right. So uh, I hope you all don't mind. I'm going to use the floating head method uh, for doing this presentation. So um, I actually, uh, what I'm going to talk about today just follows directly from the stuff that Lakeisha just talked about. I happen to be working on the same working group with Lakeisha, and and uh, so hearing everything 
that she uh, presented really sort of teased me up for some work that, that I'm going to share today, which is aligning incentives with institutional values. Um, so what I'm going to talk about actually is uh, our efforts in the Department of Psychology here at the University of Maryland that we've undertaken over the last several years to, uh, I'm going to use the word reform, uh, because that's really what we've done, to, to just sort of overhaul and reform the way we think about faculty evaluation. So I'll go into a little bit more detail as we go on here. Uh, just before we get started, though, uh, if you're interested in learning more about what we've done at Maryland, uh, I'll share some links. Actually, there's a link in the shared document uh, that can send you directly to our policies if you want to see them. I've also created this uh, OSF uh, website where we are, where I have a bunch of resources that I've used and other people have used in this space. And if anybody has any questions uh, about anything we've done, I, I encourage you to reach out to me directly and, and uh, uh, we'll set up a meeting. Happy to talk about this stuff. Okay, so um, it, I, it, I think it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Incentives matter, right? People respond to incentives no matter what it is. Now, the problem with incentives is that they also can be gamed, right? And so once you set up an incentive system and you identify some metrics or measures, those metrics and measures then become the target. And the problem, as we know from Campbell's law, but also Goodhart's law, once you, you set up those metrics, they become the target, they also cease to measure the thing that you think they are designed to measure, right? They cease to be good measures. So we know faculty will game the system. No matter what the system is, they'll game it. They'll game it either implicitly or explicitly. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Uh, but it does become problematic when the things they're trying to game are not good for science or good for fulfilling the mission of the university. And so what we've been trying to do in our reform of our promotion, tenure, annual review processes is to use metrics that first of all, first and foremost, reflect the core values of our university and institution and the core values of science. And to set up our incentive system, our promotion documents and an annual review process so, such that if people do gain those incentives, it's actually going to result in a pro-social behavior. Okay, that's what we're aiming for. Now, whether or not we actually achieve that is a whole other ballgame, but I think we're getting closer. All right, so the important thing here is that the you know, promotion and tenure policy is the, probably the most important policy on any campus for faculty, for tenure track faculty. These codif codify the incentives. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer two questions today. One is, why did we reform our policies? And then the other one I'm going to say, I'm going to describe what we did. There's a third question that I sometimes uh, dive into, which is how we do it. But that's, we don't have time to go into all those things. Um, but I'm happy to answer those questions later. So why did we reform our policy? Well, this is actually an effort that I started back in 2017. So when I became the chair of the department, one of the things I said I wanted to do was to overhaul or reform our policies to really build a more rep reproducible science. I'm in psychology, and uh, most of you probably know that psychology's dirty laundry has been out there for everybody to see, okay? Uh, we had some pretty high profile cases of academic dishonesty, uh, fraud, uh, a lot of the stuff on questionable research practices sort of emerged from what we found out what was going on in psychology. It's not unique to psychology, but uh, this is something that has been out there for about 10 to 12 to 13 years, very publicly in our field. And, and so when I took over the chairship, I thought, you know what, we really need to do something about this. Uh, I, for one, don't want to have any fraud cases in my department or, you know, but what we wanted to do was to build a more build an incentive system that is going to support trust, transparency, and reproducibility. The other thing that really drove our ultimate reform, uh, so that was the sort of impetus, the, the reproducibility issues were was the impetus for how we got started on this. Uh, but the more I dug into our existing policies, the more I realized that, you know, the way we go about incentivizing and rewarding faculty really bear, bears very little um, uh, similarity to what the universities say that is important. And I think this is probably true across academic disciplines. You know, we talk about community engagement. We talk about making our work public. We talk about solving social issues or, or, or grand challenges. And yet when you dig into the incentive systems, none of that is in there in a meaningful way. And so we really felt that it's necessary uh, for 
you know, a lot of reasons to really bring these things into alignment. The university mission statements tell you a lot about what universities are supposed to be about. Um, but when it, when the rubber hits the road, i.e. tenure, um, those core values aren't interwoven typically in a meaningful way into those policies. And the third issue here is, is that when you start digging into what are commonly used in, in uh, promotion documents, things like impact factors and citation counts, uh, those sorts of things, uh, you start digging into that literature, you realize that a lot of those metrics are seriously problematic. And I'm happy to share data on that uh, for anybody who, who isn't already familiar with, with the problems with those metrics. Okay, so um, you know, I, I said one of the impetuses for our reform efforts was the reproducibility issues. And if you weren't familiar with this, uh, you, many of you might recognize some of these headlines. Uh, I just pulled these together. Literally, it took me about 15 minutes to identify this, these 15 headlines uh, simply by Googling academic dishonesty or something like, I can't remember what my Google term was. Uh, but the problem here is, is this is what the public sees, right? So we ask questions like, well, gee whiz, why, do, why don't the public, why don't they trust academia? Why is there is this eroding faith in higher education? Uh, why are there individuals out there who just don't believe in science or who are saying things that are sort of anti-scientific? Well, you know, we don't help our case when these issues of fraud or these issues of uh, questionable re re uh, research practices um, emerge, right? And so uh, this is the problem, whether or not it's uh, an actual problem, you know, I, there are these issues out there, or whether it's a public perception problem, we need to solve this. Uh, okay, so what did we do? So that's a very brief snippet over uh, why we did what we did. Uh, but what did we do? Well, as I alluded to earlier, this was a multi-year effort. I started in, started down this path in um, roughly 2017. And over the last five or six years, uh, we've done everything from reform how we advertise our jobs. So if you look at our job advertisements, they now include things like uh, we want our applicants to address issues of, of uh, you know, what they're doing to ensure the reproducibility and transparency of the research. So that's in our job ads. Uh, when I develop startup packages, I explicitly put in money to support open access publishing. Uh, and that's something that our candidates can't get out of. They can't say, well, I don't want that money, Mike. No, I give them the money and I can't repurpose it. Uh, we also did a, an overhaul of our annual review and merit process. Uh, we overhauled our promotion and tenure documents. I developed some internal funding mechanisms and some uh, more recently, just in the last year or so, we've we've rolled out some, or in the process of rolling out some awards, all of which uh, uh, have in them essentially the same goals and reinforcing the same set of core values that we want to see people doing work that will advance fundamental science. We want to reward people who are, if they're not advancing fundamental science, but they they might be doing stuff in the community. We want to reward them for doing that work, for making their work public. We also want to make sure that we're rewarding people through all these practices, through all these uh, evaluation points, uh, for doing work that um, uh, makes their work more transparent, more reproducible, uh, more open. Uh, so that more of the work products that people are producing are available to the general public. The other thing we did, and I won't go into all the details here, we wanted to focus on uh, the behaviors of the scientists, not necessarily exclusively looking at the outputs. So we wanted to focus on the things that uh, our faculty had control over, and they have control over how they do research, how they make their work accessible. They may not have control over and often don't have control over what journal ultimately accepts their publication. Uh, they don't have control over, you know, what random things come up in review panels for grants, but they do have control over how they carry themselves and how they conduct their work. And so we really wanted to sort of refocus on those core components of faculty behavior that support good research practices, research integrity, ethics, and a, a variety of other types of things that we do. So uh, again, building on this, uh, what did we do? Well, um, I think a, a very concise way of saying this is to say we developed a more modern, inclusive and fair approach. Um, so if you look at our tenure at, at promotion documents, uh, words such as inclusiveness are not just put in there for posterior purposes, they're actually in there for purposes of people being evaluated. Uh, 
uh, we wanted to build a a, a, a document that uh, were incentives that uh, encouraged high quality reproducible science. Uh, we wanted to reward people who were doing work that benefited society, people who were doing work that engaged with the community. Not that we're requiring people to do these, but we wanted to give them avenues for promotion that recognized all these other things that people could be doing for the benefit of society and which fulfilled the university's mission. We wanted to give those people a pathway for promotion that didn't you know, force them into this sort of singular way in which most tenure documents that I've looked at envision um, success. Um, and I won't go into all these other little things here, but you know, the bottom line is you know, we have problems to solve uh, in this world and we can't do it by holding up in our uh, little bubbles and not sharing our work public. And so we really wanted to incentivize people to take risks, to share their work as widely as possible and, uh, uh, and really accelerate science. Here's a, a few examples of some of our criteria. So if you, again, take a look at our, our full document, you'll get the sort of full picture. Uh, and I'm just pulling these from one small section of our, our overarching criteria. This is under the category of quality and potential for impact, right? Um, so uh, first one really talks about, the first line up here really talks about community, of application of basic science for addressing real world problems or societal needs. So this really relates to this issue of we're solving problems that are relevant to our communities. Uh, the second bullet point here, um, uh, this is, you know, I think something uh, that is really important within psychological science because historically, uh, Underrepresented groups really haven't been part of the scientific process, let alone um, we haven't really addressed those problems that are pertinent for a lot of the historically underrepresented groups. And so we wanted to give people uh, an avenue to tenure that recognized that if they're going to do work that addresses these historical gaps, this is a this is valued and important, and this is a pathway uh, for promotion. Um, jumping down to number four here really talks about the openness and transparency component. So that fits with the, the theme of this um, um, uh, uh, seminar. Uh, so we recognize the development of research tools, code, data, and the open sharing of those resources. And then finally, we wanted to, to encourage people to engage in transparent, ethically sound uh, and reproducible research. And so these are all criteria. And then, of course, we have a mechanism for how people can demonstrate that. We uh, we use sort of a, a, a new version of a CV where we have people annotate their research uh, uh, CV. So uh, a citation isn't just a single line that tells you the name of the article and the publication location. It actually has details associated with each one of those articles that talks about, you know, how they're hitting each one of these different components within our uh, criteria. We call that an annotated CV. Uh, okay, so what did I learn throughout this process? So I'm going to wrap up here in two slides. Uh, number one, and this is, I think, great, is that faculty see value in making their work transparent, in reaching a broad audience. So faculty want to do the right thing. And, you know, the great thing is, is many faculty are already doing it. The sad thing is, is they aren't always getting rewarded for it, which means they probably could do it more if it was for part of the reward st structure. But many faculty are already making those pro-social behaviors, right? Faculty are saying, well, I could publish in this, or this journal, which will reach... Uh, you know, is highly prestigious, but isn't going to be accessed accessible to those people um, in uh, the global south. Or I can publish in this other avenue that is uh, accessible to the global south. Uh, the other thing I learned is that we've been doing it one way for so long that it's really hard to imagine something different, right? Uh, we, I mean, the, the who knows where our current system came from? Uh, but just because we've been doing it one way doesn't mean it's the right way. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I was able to sort of coax my faculty out of that sort of notion that, well, we're doing it this way. We should do it this way. That's the system I went through. So everybody should have to go through that system. So we, we've, we've uh, sort of gotten ourselves out of that loop. Uh, the, other, the third thing here is that it, if you want to do this type of thing, it takes time to socialize and educate. Lakeisha talked a little bit about this. Uh, this was a five-year process. I didn't like walk into a room and say, here's what we're going to do, guys. Let's do it. Um, uh, in fact, what I learned is that doesn't work. And what I ended up doing was spending a lot of time educating my faculty uh, in, in very subtle ways. Uh, there's a lot of intentionality and persistence that's involved. And here's the best part is that if you talk to administrators, they're cool with it. Okay, They, they are interested in new ways of doing things and they're open to it. Uh, so this shouldn't be a real uh, 
um, impediment to changing the way we do things, because I think the administrators are generally open. Well, there's still probably always disagreements about how it works. Uh, okay, so just uh, to wrap up here with one last slide, uh, Lakeisha mentioned uh, Helios. I've been on the working group with, with Lakeisha. Um, and uh, so uh, a lot of great stuff going on within the Helios uh, sphere. Uh, one of the things I've been doing is working with a few people that are part of Helios and the Open Research Funders Group to run some workshops. So we've run some workshops for various psychology departments. We did it at a, uh, the annual meeting for graduate uh, departments of psychology chairs, one at the Association of Psychological Science. And, and uh, uh, I'll leave you with an open invitation that if you are interested, your community or whatever is interested in running a workshop, uh, uh, we will uh, engage with you and try to put one together. So. Um, I hope Greg, Aaron, Caitlin, and Eunice uh, from ORFRG don't don't kill me for this, but uh, I, you know we would be we would love to be able to do this. And again, if you have questions about any of this stuff, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. This is so interesting. Um, we have time for one or two questions for Michael individually. If anybody has any. I actually have a question. Um, I was curious about the reaction of other departments at your university. You mentioned you've talked to other psychology departments and noted that um, psychologists are very aware of these issues of reproducibility. And I think a lot of us think of them as being on the forefront of these open science practices. And so I'm curious if you've had conversations with other department heads where you are about these policies. Um, I, I, yes. Um... There's no like straightforward answer, you know, uh, commentary on that. Uh, we we went through as a college a a round of revisions, and we so we were passing back our promotion documents between various departments, and uh, I think some of the other disciplines just aren't ready, quite frankly, um, for making these. You know, we're we're doing something very different from many other departments. I think a lot better, uh, but uh, I'm not too sure that everybody's there yet, and that's the education side, to be honest. That makes sense. Um, we have a question in the Q&A. How do these new guidelines integrate, if at all, with ideas around slow science, allowing more space for thoughtful engagement with science, research that involves community participation, et cetera? Yeah, th that is an excellent question. And in fact, one of the, one of the uh, sort of issues in the background that we were thinking about when we developed these uh, 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 if you take a look at the guidelines, you'll see sort of some of this language built into them. But uh, uh, we don't mention slow science per se, but what we have done is is we've gotten rid of metrics. So we don't look at uh, citation counts and impact factors. Those have been expunged from our criteria, but we've also been careful to reframe things in terms of substance, not quality, a quantity. Uh, so the focus of our review process is substance over quantity. And so, and that's something that I've had to drill into to people over time. And, you know, that's an ongoing process. But, um, you know, I think that very much fits with this idea of getting it right should be the first thing that we should be concerned about. And then getting a lot should be really uh, backburnered. So I, I totally agree with that. And the, the issue with uh community participation and participatory studies. And this is, you know, psychology is a very diverse field. And a lot of people are doing that community engaged participatory research. And we recognize that that type of work can be much more labor intensive, take much more time to curate. And so part of the reason that we're kind of backing off of numbers is because we want to be able to give people space to do that. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions. Wajin Wang, our former colleague here says, Thanks for the great talk. I wonder what are your thoughts on extending the work on faculty evaluation to student success? And what are the points of entry that rigor and transparency can be built in for students? Yeah, um, gosh, that, that's a that's a great question. I'll, I'll admit I haven't given the evaluation process for students uh, much thought, but uh, one of the things on my agenda right now is rolling out training in uh, principally research integrity that really hits on a lot of these issues, but not in terms of, of the evaluative process. So, uh, but I think that's a really important aspect, particularly when we think about those students are the people who are applying for faculty jobs in the future, right? And, and we really want them to be teeing themselves up to be successful in all possible ways. But I, I wish I had a better answer for you. 
Thank you. And we have a comment from our Associate Dean of Academic Engagement here, Nikki Agate, who says that um, she's been working with the Humetrics team with a number of Michael's colleagues, including the Dean of Arts and Humanities and various department chairs at UMD to expand this excellent values-based assessment work beyond psychology. So very great to hear that. Um, so with that, um, we will move on to our last speaker in this session. And again, if anybody has more questions for Michael, there will be another chance to ask him during the panel. Oh, sorry. Our final speaker in the session is Jamaica Jones, the program coordinator of the NASA TOPS mission and the executive secretary of the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy subgroup on the year of open science. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Um, hold on, give me one second to queue up my slides. I would love your help um, in knowing, hold on one second. I practiced this a few times, but I'd still love your help in knowing whether or not you're seeing the participant view or the, uh, pre the presenter view or the view. And this always takes a few seconds on my computer, so... Uh, um, I think I might have frozen there, but this does always take a few seconds on my computer. Um, it has okay, been that looks good. Yeah, now we're seeing the. Um, now we're seeing the speaker view, but that looks good. Okay, so now you can see the 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 view that is intended for the for the participants and not the one with my secret notes. Correct. Yes. Wonderful. Um, thank you. And thank you for that introduction and for bearing with my technical um, glitches over here. I am indeed Jamaica Jones. I'm the program coordinator of the NASA TOPS mission, as mentioned. And I will be talking about our work to transform to open science at NASA and beyond. And um, thank you to Lakeisha for your, your kind introduction of the year of open science. I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you about that as well. Um, I'm going to briefly go over um, open science, kind of writ large at NASA, and then move into TOPS, which is short for Transform to Open Science. And then I really will be spending the bulk of the time here um, talking about a, a year of open science and what we've been doing with OSTP in the White House. So at NASA, at home, um, hold on one second. Over here on my end, my, my screen is quite small. Um, our commitments to open science are evident across the landscape of, the, of NASA science, uh, woven into the research and uh, community engagement efforts across NASA writ large. A lot of that is in, this is integrated into internal policy regarding the sharing of scientific data and other research and mission outputs. Um, internally, these commitments extend across the science mission directorate, which is kind of what people think of when they think of NASA. Um, it's referred to in short as SMD. The science mission directorate is central to the NASA mission, engaging the nation's science community, sponsoring scientific research, and developing and deploying satellites and probes in collaboration with NASA's partners around the world to answer fundamental questions requiring the view from and into space. working. I'm having not advancing slides over here. There we go. I'm sorry that took so long. Um, well, <laughs> in all that time, I should have pointed out that at the bottom of the screen, there was a green um, rectangle that said the chief data science office with a little arrow that was pointing up. That's meant to indicate that the chief data science office, which is where TOPS is housed, is the office at NASA that's tasked with making the most of the science data that emerges from NASA research. It does so by advancing these three goals. And as you can see, open science is centered right at the top of this list, supporting some of NASA's highest level priorities. Within CSDO sits a smaller unit called the Open Science Open Source Science Initiative, which is NASA's, NASA's means of operationalizing open science. And that's where I sit in my work at TOPS. OSSI works primarily across four areas, and the TOPS mission is aligned with the community engagement focus. As many of you, I'm guessing, probably already know, TOPS is a five-year mission to accelerate the adoption of open science both within NASA and beyond. 
Um, as has already been ably discussed here, open science principles um, embrace transparency, collaboration, and participation. Recognizing this, TOPS has been designed to support the community through, through engagement opportunities, through resources, incentives, and coordination. The TOPS mission is to inspire and, and empower scientists, researchers, and communities to embrace open science as a catalyst for positive change. Now, towards that first objective, which is increasing understanding and adoption of open science principles and techniques, the TOPS team has been hard at work developing Open Science 101, which is a, com a community-developed introduction to core open science skills. The training has been piloted at some conferences throughout the past year and is currently in development as a five-module course. It's in the last stages of its beta testing and is targeted for release next month. Once it's launched, um, it'll be taught through either a self-paced online course or synchronously through online and in-person workshops. It's a really excellent opportunity not only to develop new, uh, uh, the skills necessi necessary to participate in open science effectively, but to also demonstrate those skills when you're applying for NASA funding and other funding opportunities. You can sign up if you're interested using the QR code on the screen. I also provided the same link, that, link in the community notes document that Melanie and her team were so kind to set up. Um, okay, so we were super excited about Open Science 101 this year, but that's not the only thing that uh, we had to celebrate. Um, as I'm sure you all know, on January 11th, earlier this year, we were delighted to receive official White House recognition of 2023 as the year of open science. As part of a year of open science, NASA has been working with partners across 17 federal agencies and offices to spark change and inspire open science engagement through initiatives that will advance adoption of open science across the federal sphere and ideally beyond. At the federal level, the year of open science has been coordinated and advanced by a subgroup of the NSTC Subcommittee on Open Science. The NSTC stands for the National Science and Technology Council, which is part of the broad policy apparatus that supports the science policy initiatives advanced out of the White House. I enjoy the tremendous honor um, of being the executive secretary of the subgroup on the year of open science. I've been in that role since the very inception of the group, which was the middle of last year, actually. And I'm uh, really happy to share some of our major accomplishments thus far. Um, First, and as already mentioned, we've secured official participation from over 17 federal agencies and offices. It's a really diverse bunch, um, which we're proud of, including representatives from NASA, from NSF, from NOAA, but also the Smithsonian, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the State Department, and many others. Many others, as you can see, like scrolling off the bottom of the, the uh, slide there. Together, our participating agencies represent over $100 billion in federal science funding. The group is co-chaired by NASA, by NSF and NOAA, and in its first few month, months set forth four goals for the year, including establishing strategic approaches towards open science, increasing openness and transparency of review processes, accounting for open science and activities in review, recognition, and incentives, and doing all of the above while engaging communities that have been historically underrepresented in the practice of science. The intent behind these goals is not that they would be achieved by the end of the year. Um, it's a, a running theme throughout the last two um, segments here has been that uh, this is really a culture change and that these things that we're talking about take time, can take a lot of time. So rather the intent was that participating agencies, each of which is quite unique and responsible to a diverse uh, research community, would develop individualized approaches to these goals as is appropriate within their home cultures and missions. Supporting this work, we drafted a federal definition of open science, which uh, which goes like this. Hold on, I got to move my thing out of the out of the way again. I got a small screen. Um, open science is the principle and practice of making research products and processes available to all, while respecting diverse cultures, maintaining security and privacy, and fostering collaborations, reproducibility, and equity. You note that this, that this definition really embeds those commitments to equitability, to reproducibility, and a respect for a diverse array of knowledge types and sources. Okay, so our subgroup has done a lot and achieved a lot, leading to something that we've all been really proud of, which is the extent and productivity of our interagency collaboration. 
The kind of collaboration can be really difficult to achieve across federal agencies, but by coming together and sharing resources, insights, and lessons learned, we've been able to support our participating agencies in advancing open science individually as well. Towards that end, we've been proud to announce the series of early career researcher listening sessions that OSTP held earlier this year, engaging over a thousand participants in a consideration of the opportunities and roadblocks faced by scientists who are just getting started in their careers and who want to and who are already engaged in advancing open science in their work. Meanwhile, and actually a few months prior, the U.S. Geological Survey themselves engaged a broad community of researchers in an open data for open science data integration workshop, working towards that discipline specific capacity building that's so necessary to move the needle here. Uh, funding is, of course, also essential in moving the needle, so we were delighted to announce right at the start of our work NSF's investment of over $12 million in its new Pharos RCN program. That is another acronym, of course, because it's the federal government. Uh, that one stands for FAIR, as in the FAIR data principles, so FAIR Open Science Research Coordination Networks. Now, hand-in-hand -hand with funding... Um, as Michael just discussed, uh, incentivization, incentivization is absolutely crucial in advancing open science across our communities. So recognizing this, we're thrilled to announce the White House open, uh, OSTP Year of Open Science Recognition Challenge. This was just announced a couple weeks ago. It was designed to celebrate stories of team-built open science that benefit society, address a challenge, and advance a solution to that challenge, all while embodying open science principles. It's administered through challenge.gov. Um, I put a link to it in the community notes. Um, the challenge is structured such that teams can nominate themselves. There are six categories of consideration, um, including open science in service to communities, open science to advance education, and open science to advance solutions to pressing global challenges. There are also categories recognizing technical advancements that themselves enable open science, open science advancements that enable innovation, and last but not least, open science to advance interdisciplinary collaboration. We're really thrilled about this challenge um, it, because it presents such a great opportunity to recognize scientists who have been practicing, supporting, and enabling open science, often without recognition, for so long. Um, we hope that you'll consider nominating yourself if a project that you've worked on meets the criteria, and we'd really love your help. We'd welcome your help in sharing word of the opportunity across your networks. Um, this is my final slide, just FYI. Um, while the challenge.gov page offers a ton of information about the challenge, there'll also be a short information session about it, featuring my subgroup colleagues, um, including Miriam Zaringhelm, OSDP's Assistant Director for Public Access and Research Policy. That'll be taking place next Wednesday, November 8th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can sign up via the link that you see on the screen, um, which is of course also in the community notes document. So that um, that brings my time to a close. Thank you again for the introduction, um, for the invitation, and for this time to talk to you about TOPS and our work with the Year of Open Science. Thank you so much, Jamaica. Um, again, does anybody have any specific or questions specific for Jamaica before we move on to the panel? Um, I actually have one, and it's possible Lakeisha and Michael could also comment on this, but they can do that during the panel if they, if they want to. But you mentioned the early um, career researcher listening sessions, and I was curious if there is any concern among early career researchers as to the money that it might take for them to um, adopt these data sharing practices. I know that they can write into their budgets, but it seems like that's money that they're probably taking away from something else if they're running a lab. And I know, you know, Michael noted that uh, they include money for OA publishing um, in their packages. And so um, the money is obviously very important and there's a cost to this. So I'm just curious if there has been any concern from early career researchers on the financial aspects of this. There were, if I recall, four sessions and about a thousand people participated and financial, what were perceived as financial roadblocks um, emerged as one of the most consistent 
um, and regularly voiced concerns that uh, that our attendees raised. Um, there was broad concern about the financial costs and potential limit limitations and also the um, repercussions that that would have for equity concerns. Um, it was a, it was a very real, uh, very real concern. Um, I didn't link in the community notes, but will following this session, um, a link to the readout of those sessions. They weren't recorded, but they were nicely um, captured in some extensive notes that the White House put up on their blog. So I'll, I'll include that link in the community notes so that you can read more a little bit more about it there. But yes, definitely. Thank you. And we have a question from our colleague, Saeed Chaudhary. Uh, for the Open Science Recognition Challenge, do the submissions have to come from individual researchers or could institutional projects also be considered? We are hoping to recognize team-based projects. So absolutely, um, we welcome nominations of projects. That's the, the, they were, the challenge was designed around that um, expectation that, that it would be more project-based work than individual work. Great, thank you. And we have a comment and question from Amy Koshifer. And this is actually something we talk a lot about in our outreach as well as this term science. I wonder if the term science may exclude some researchers. It is STEM focused. How do you see all researchers participating in this effort? Um, we, this has been um, an ongoing conversation across the, the subgroup and, and with OSTP about how to phrase this, whether we want to talk about science, research, or scholarship. Um, I found in the last year and a half of working with the subgroup that we tend to think of and try to refer to science and research as broadly as possible so as to include participation from and um little self-recognition by people who don't generally fit a traditional understanding of science. I mean, I know that, I, I mean, I wear multiple hats. I work for NASA. I also work as a liaison to the White House. I'm also getting a PhD across the road from CMU at Pitt um, in, a, in an area of focus that has me engage a lot with exactly how science is defined. And, and in my work, I think, I find that my own definition, my own understanding of science is quite limited. Um, but we are and we have made efforts in our language and in our year of open science communications to be as broad as possible and to extend that understanding so that um, people like me can continue to um, see ourselves um, in, a, in a community that we might not have otherwise. Thank you. Yes, I know we we often kind of go back and forth between open science and open research to be broader at Carnegie Mellon. And I will say that it's been really nice having the definition from the White House and something we can. That's wonderful to hear. <laughs> um, okay, so with that, uh, we'll bring all of our speakers from this panel back on screen so we can do some panel questions. Um, and I'm, I'm going to kick it off with a question that I'll direct to Lakeisha first. Um, so I think you mentioned that Whitman had, um, as an institution, committed to updating their policies. And then we've also heard from Michael, where they enacted this change at the department level. And I'm curious if you have any insight as to whether you think one of these approaches will end up being more common um, as this work goes forward. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, hello, Michael, because uh, he did a great job of breaking it down at the departmental level. I don't know that my institution would um, <clears throat> be able to do that at the departmental level, per se. Um, I think Whitman worked out really well because Alzada is the provost. And so she has a direct line to the president. She has, um, you know, direct lines to faculty and deans. And so um, for so I think that's probably why it worked out really well for her. Cause, um, and so for me, it's about scheduling meetings with the deans, uh, the provost, um, having them talk to the president, um, and then you know bringing it to the faculty simultaneously because um, we're all at the shared governance meetings monthly. Um, so that's what we've been trying to figure out basically is what is the best approach. And so I don't think there's any one way, but um, I would say definitely if you have your provost on board, you should be good to go.
Great. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to say? Or are there any other questions from the audience? Just giving people a minute to type. Okay, somebody is typing right now. So <laughs> take your time. I, I can follow a little bit up uh, on Lakeisha's comments. Um, so I, I have I've had the opportunity to work both within my university, mostly within my department, but also with other department chairs within psychology. And uh, I think disciplines will play in a, a very important role um, because you know if you think about the first line of evaluation is really your colleagues, and uh, so having communities of scholars solving the problem within a discipline, I think, is going to be really, really important for pushing culture change. People look around, they want to say, well, who else is doing it? And no one wants to go first. No one wants to go last, <laughs> but no one definitely wants to go first uh, within a field. So I think that's going to be a crucial component of it. Um, and, you know, just one one last thing, you know, uh, some people oftentimes I hear people say things like, uh, well, it's really hard to push culture change. It's true, but it's not solving climate change. Okay, that's a hard problem. So if we put this in perspective, really what we're asking people to do is to engage in uh, a pro-social behavior, right? And people want to do the right thing. And so that's not hard. It's just getting the mechanisms in place. And sometimes the bureaucracies can sometimes, you know, impose barriers that don't need to be there. Great, thank you. And I sort of have a follow-up question to that. So um, and it's a little bit similar to Washington's question earlier, but um, so in my work as librarian here, you know, it's pretty noticeable that, um, you know, sometimes postdocs and graduate students are interested in engaging with open science, but the PIs of the labs, at least in science, really kind of drive the culture of um, the work and how it's done in the labs. And this was my experience as well as a graduate student and postdoc. And do you have, we do have some graduate students and postdocs in the audience today, and I'm just curious if you have any words of wisdom for them. Is there anything that they can think about aside from the fact that, you know, when they open their own labs, if they continue staying in academia, then that is a chance for them to, you know, um, have the work culture, the open science culture that they would like in uh, with their trainees, but is there anything that they can think about in the meantime? Who's that one for? Anybody who has any <laughs> thought. I know you you both work with graduate students and Jamaica, you're a graduate student yourself. So if anybody has any insights as to, yeah, some of these, like I'm thinking particularly of like some of these very successful PIs and they are used to doing things a certain way and they've had a ton of success. And so they might not be incentivized to change their practices unless they're forced to by the funding agencies and whatnot. Um, well, I mean, I'm a department chair, so I'm kind of in a weird place. Um, but I, my senses and listening to my own colleagues, and this is, I mean, I, I, the graduate students are going to, they're beholden to their lab PIs. I mean, I, I recognize that. So a lot of it probably really does fall on leadership to send the right signals to reinforce the types of things that they want to see their universities do. And that is not just department chairs, but I think deans and provosts especially. Um, and so those messages are really, really important uh, because ultimately we're responsible for training the next generation. And uh, I've been very consistent and persistent with the messages I do with my department. And it's, it's been taken some time, but the faculty, like you hear them talking about these things now and you hear the students talking about it. a lot of people using open science methods and stuff like that. I'm also in psychology where it's been kind of out there for a while. So that might be a little different. I don't come from a position of, um, I mean, I'm a grad student, but uh, my hope is that this will be my, the, the end of my career in academia and then I'll continue to work in policy. Um, and, you know, having had this perspective from working with TOPS and particularly be working as a liaison to OSTP during like the, the Nelson memo era, I can't help but wonder about the effects that policy guidance will have on, on a change in, in culture as well. I mean, as the Nelson memo goes, the, the guidance goes into effect, um, federally funded researchers will be required to have an ORCID ID, will be required to deposit their research 
data will be required to do all of these things that will help to affect that culture change over the long term. It may not be immediate. It may not affect um, uh, today's graduate students, but it might well help the case of those who are coming five, six, seven years down the line. Um, we actually, okay, we have a comment from Wajin. Um, NINS just had a funding opportunity to implement open science at the department level. That's really interesting. Um, cause we have heard, yeah, there's a need for funding for the implementation of this for some disciplines. Okay. So, um, we have comments and a question from Matthew Humphreys. One aspect of encouragement for open science that has come up throughout the symposium, but is especially apt to this panel, is the order in which engagement efforts happen. We could train graduate students, for example, to care about and be proficient in open science practices, but if the systems they move into do not reward that, their real-world education will only teach them that part of their training was maladaptive. We can try to include faculty in these discussions, but especially where there are faculty senates that can lead to policies becoming stalled over faculty hesitancy and a lack of knowledge about open science. Education combined with dialogue seems to be the first step in helping encourage open science, but what does the order of events look like beyond this if one were to try and blueprint this encouragement? I so, so that comment really hits on to what we have been discussing for, you know, the past years, you know, um, for me, for us, I would say, um, having the, the starting, just committing to having those discussions, um, having certain individuals trained, like I said, for me, I'm being trained on all of this and I've had to take time to really learn about the open science practices. So now I feel that I can go and educate the faculty, um, and have those conversations with the faculty senate. I do agree with you that things can get held up there. Um, so I'm making a commitment to just keep moving those conversations along, putting myself on the agenda at least, and if not every month, every other month because of, of my schedule. Um, but I do, I know, I know at my university we are really starting to take a look at the postdocs and how to prepare them for careers outside of our particular university, and so. This is actually, um, that was a great question. So now I'm um, looking at how can I engage them in the open science discussion, which is something that um, I don't think we've collectively talked to them about now. So, um, but yeah, I agree. Just start by committing to have the discussion at your university, I think is the first um, part that we should do. I don't know if Jamaica, if you want to say anything before I open my mouth again, but uh, I can share some thoughts. No, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think it's a great question. And, and uh, you know, I, part of me is like, you know, training is so important that uh, we can't just skip over these reproducibility issues and hope that they'll be fixed later because we know that's just not going to happen. So there's, there's some aspect of we have a moral responsibility to ensure that our uh, students are doing things the right way. Um, and I can share some you know, sort of anecdotal things like when students come to you and say, I want to be part of the, the solution, not the problem, like literally graduate students. So, you know, they oftentimes want to be the solution finders, uh, but we shouldn't be putting students in a place where they say, oh, well, I'll do what I need to do now to get a job. And then when I have my own lab, you know, uh, I will do things differently because once they get that new job, then they're going to be looking at, okay, well, now that I have this job, now I need a tenure. When I get tenure, then I'll start doing things differently. And then it's going to be something else. And that, that's, that's just never going to solve the problem. And, and so part of this is what I try to do internally to my department, but also my campus is every single time I have a lever to pull, uh, I will use that lever to point out issues. For example, when I write letters for promotion or whatever, I include data sentences that state, you know, here's why we don't use citation counts because they are biased. OK, they do not reflect the thing that people think they do. And I, then that goes to our dean and that goes to the provost. And so every time they see one of these, they're getting that repetition of what's wrong with the system. Um, and I know that's just internal to our department. But, you know, when I have levers that I can pull outside the department, I try to pull them. And that's really what we all should be doing, um, because the more times we say it, 
the more often we say it, the more likely it is that people will start changing their minds. Do you have anything you'd like to share, Jamaica? No, I was just sort of reflecting. I mean, I guess yes. Um, reflecting on the the um, the common thread in Michael and Lakeisha's answers, were sort of starting where you are um, and doing that little bit that you can. I I actually noticed throughout her presentation when um, Lakeisha, you mentioned about um, just getting people to commit to having the conversation, even at the federal level. I mean, maybe especially at the federal level. I I, I also mentioned that getting um, agencies to coordinate is very difficult because they each have internal um, cultures to state the obvious. And so it Whereas we we sort of came out with guns blazing with these great hopes for the year of open science, it turned out that um, where we the best place to start from an interagency perspective, which was where we were, which was to have people make um, moderate commitments to advance to starting the conversations within their agencies and figuring out how it worked best for them to move forward individually. Um, so. Um, yeah, I would. I I suppose I don't have anything to say other than to notice that that seems to be a theme that's emerging here. Yeah, and I would say the type of university definitely matters. Um, I, Chris, who is uh, one of the co leads, um, she you know she works at MIT, and she said they're not going to make any changes. Um, and so, but she's you know she still shows up. She's active in the meetings. Um, and so I think just by her having these discussions, I think they are, um there's a pathway for them to make um, some changes um, before, you know, the mandates come down and you have to make the changes. So I think getting, changing that culture and the mindset is just the, really the toughest part. Great. Um, our next question is kind of about this idea of qualitative versus quantitative metrics for open science. And so the question is from Colette Blinsky and it was about um, if there's a way of making some of the criteria for um, tenure, tenure applying for positions or advancing a graduate degree as it relates to open science quantitative. Um, and then Nikki is pointing out um, and echoing a comment from Said earlier that this can lead to people gaming the system, that dashboards are easy and people tend to be drawn to them, but there is um, some issues with that and that a qualitative approach around open as a prioritized process is what we need in the spirit of slow scholarship and slow science if we really value something such as openness it might be that we need to accept that assessment criteria might also require a slow approach so I'm just curious about thoughts on this um, idea of quantitative versus qualitative metrics I don't want to like take all the air time but I so anybody else want to go no, no, go ahead. Yeah, it, it, actually, this is uh, uh, very much uh, uh, relevant to the way we do things in the psychology now here at the University of Maryland. You know, the quantitative metrics tend to sort of boil things down into numbers. So you think you can compare, can compare apples to apples. Um, but the problem is, is that the underlying units are not apples, right? Different people are doing different things. There's no two researchers that are the same. And so I think we sometimes... Uh, don't take this the wrong way. I think sometimes the metrification of these processes, you know, can fool us into thinking that we have some really great tools for measuring success. And I think that's a problem because the things we're trying to measure are not unitary, um, uh, uh, homogenous entities. Like even within, you know, two faculty studying similar topics within the Department of Psychology here or anywhere, they could take very, very different approaches and their dossiers are gonna look very different depending on whether they're doing that community participatory work or whether they're doing online studies or whether they're doing fMRI work, even if they're trying to answer the same question. So I, you know, I, I'm hesitant to sort of say, okay, let's, let's get rid of the um, nuances and think about numbers. Um, and, you know, we've approached this as we don't wanna mandate. We actually, you know, we, we started in 2017, this was before the OSTP memo, um, and uh, we're trying not to mandate do people to do things in different ways because we recognize things will evolve over time. 
Um, and so we want to give people that flexibility and agency to meet, you know, the criteria in the way that they best do their work, if you will. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I'll say that I think this is a debate that's come up in our previous symposia as well, uh, particularly around this idea of how you um, measure and acknowledge data reuse. And so we've had, I remember speakers in the past who were really arguing that you might need an extra dimension to the current citation system um, that allows for people to be recognized for their data sets being reused. Um, but then we've had other people that have suggested that that kind of just plays more into the current system that's very quantified and how you really need an entirely different system for um, acknowledging open science. And so it's, I think, um, something that continues to be grappled with. Um, any other comments on that topic before we move on? Well, just one is, is the... Uh... One of the issues is, I think, many of the stuff that we, things that we use to evaluate faculty really can be boiled down to reputation metrics. And the problem with reputation is that reputation begets reputation begets reputation, which means unless you come into it already ahead of the game, you're going to fall behind, right? Uh, classic Matthew effect, right? And that'll happen both with citations, publications, uh, but also data reuse, right? You, you will tend to use the data from labs that already have that reputation, so... Yeah, I think it's important that as we think about these new systems that we're not, um, you know, there's a potential to kind of accidentally um, emphasize these inequities that already exist um, within academia. And there's a need to be intentional and make sure that we're not making those yeah. even worse. Yeah, I was going to say just just quick point. So that that really um, ties into what we what we're trying to establish. What are the resources that are needed as um, because every university is resourced differently, has a different mission. And so it's it's really important as you look at your own university and your own um, capabilities of before you make drastic changes, are you able to handle that? And I know that's something that we're looking at right now. Um, there's more comments and discussion in the Q&A here. Um, Saeed is also commenting on this idea where he links to an article, which we will put in the community docs, if it's not already there, that is an important overview of open access publishing from the global south. And it shows how well indexing of the scholarship is accounted for by Web of Science, EBSCOhost, and Scopus. And so using those types of metrics can arguably ignore a great deal of research and literature from the global south. That's an excellent point. Um, and then Cheryl says, maybe trying to measure provides a common language to discuss what should be measured. Okay, is there any other, we have a few more minutes for this panel Q and A. Oh, we do have another question. Is team science something that our metrics should support? And if so, how can we best support that work? I can say yes. Um, it, it, hard to, I, I think the uh, um, the credit system is kind of important. You know, the, the authorship crediting system uh, is important for documenting how people are making their contributions to team science, but generally, yes. And that's one of the things that, again, motivated some of the work we did, was just making it more modern uh, to recognize secondary data use, collaborative uh, research, um, it's not the same as it used to be when we were all just kind of doing our own thing. Any other comments on this idea of team science and how we acknowledge that? I do think that credit is a good start. Um, I had a fellowship with the Society of Scholarly Publishing and did a very limited study of how credit was being implemented by uh, publishers. And it was 
limited. Um, so there's some uptake yet still to to be accomplished for that to be a totally effective system. Um, just, you know, um, but, you know, as as we were talking about earlier, the the maybe the most important step is the first one. So it's good that that was um, taken. I also think towards team science, it would um, seems like it would really depend on the discipline. Yeah, and I think like Michael, you noted that there's a lot of differences in how the disciplines have adopted these practices and their attitudes around them. And I would imagine, you know, team science is I think becoming more interdisciplinary as well. And so there's a real opportunity there um, as disciplines, you know, collaborate with psychology researchers if they're in fields that have not adopted some of these practices to kind of maybe normalize them a bit in their own home disciplines. Um, okay, we have just a few minutes left in this panel. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Well, I just want to say thank you to um, for all of the questions because it's given me a lot to think about um, as we prepare. We're rounding out the semester, um, but I've, I've been taking some notes on things I want to take back to our um, leadership because oh, I've been really pushing this a lot. <laughs> well, um, yes, people are putting some very nice comments in the chat. Yeah. Excellent panel, great speakers. Um, yes, I think we're super excited to have this panel today because like I said, this has always come up a lot in the discussions of these symposium, but we've never really directly addressed it. And I think um, you know, before Helios, I think it would have been hard for us to maybe even find the people who were <laughs> willing to talk so openly about this. So um, I think this was really the right year for us to address this, uh, especially with the year of open science. So um, with that, I want to just thank our panelists here again, Lakeisha, Michael, and Jamaica, um, for some really excellent discussion around this idea of incentives and policy. It's a very important topic. Um, and with that, we are going to take a short break before we come back for our last session of the day on open access publishing. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you.